Good morning and welcome to the Board of County Commissioners for Pinellas County's May 7th, 2019 meeting. Uh, today our invocation will be led by Reverend Ryan R. Whitley from St. Thomas Episcopal Church in St. Petersburg. I'd ask you all to please stand and thereafter the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Commissioner Justice as well as a special Pure Pinellas presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Oh God, you have made us in your own image. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in the bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth that in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you would, please remain standing. Okay. For today's Pure Pinellas, uh, Pinellas County is a county of arts and culture and music, and today we have with us three-time Florida Marching Band Championship State Championship title winners, the Northside Christian Royal Ambassador Marching Band from Northside Christian in Lelman, Florida. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, welcome, Mr. Nathan Farrell, the Arts Director at Northside Christian. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, I'm Nathan Farrell. I've been the Fine Arts Director at Northside for just over 20 years now. Funny how fast that goes by. Um, in that time, the band's won seven state championships. Um, and the band has a long storied history going back to the early 70s when the school was founded. Um, while uh, the band is highly competitive and the kids work very, very hard, and we'll let these two fine men introduce themselves to you in just a minute, um, the philosophy of the band is based on uh, Christian ministry and community service. So we do a number of things, and we try to uh, make sure that the kids understand that you know the trophies and medals are merely a side effect, not a, an end goal in what we do. A few years ago, they had the opportunity to um, put on a community extravaganza down at Mahaffey Theater in St. Petersburg honoring veterans. Uh, as a, a lead up to our trip to Hawaii where we played for the 75th anniversary of the uh, Pearl Harbor attack which was a tremendous experience for our kids. They joined with 1,600 other uh, band kids from uh, Hawaii and the uh, you know 48 and played on the uh, 
the deck by the Missouri, right there by um, the memorial, which was powerful. These two were among them. And um, so it continues year after year. We just try to find opportunities. We take trips, do community <coughs> service things, and um, play our music as much as we can. And uh, it was great to be able to play here, as it's great sometimes to play in a community center gym in the inner city like they have done in Atlanta and a few other uh, places around. So we thank you very much. I guess I'll let the boys introduce themselves to you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, how are you guys doing today? It's good to see you. Uh, how are you doing, Commissioner doing Kenneth Brooks? Good to see you. Familiar you fantastic, face. as always. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, my name's Jordan Bolds. I don't know if I already said that, but um, I'm in 12th grade. Chase is also in 12th grade. Um, I play sax, and along with that, I also play piano a little bit. Um, best at sax, though, so I'll stick to that. Um, <coughs> I'm actually committed to UCF. That's where I'll be going for college. Yeah, congratulations. Um, my major, surprisingly, is not music. It's actually biomedical engineering. Oh my, uh, my mom was a consultant when, before she became a math teacher. She's actually a math teacher at Bradenton School of the Arts, Manatee, Manatee School of the Arts um, in Bradenton. So she's a math teacher. I love math. <laughs> I love science. Yeah, so I, I love to encapsulate everything in math, so I ended up picking my major as biomedical engineering, so um, that, that's what I'm going to be studying when I go into college. However, I will be minoring in music as well, <laughs> All right, of course. just in case you were wondering. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for having us, and I really appreciate it. Very thank nice. you very much. Good morning. I'm uh, Chase Farrell. Uh, this is my dad. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't have too much of a choice. <laughs> uh, um, but I actually, I do really enjoy, you know, making music. Um, and, you know, like, same kind of as him. I do play a little piano, but I mostly try to stick to the trombone just because, you know, it's what I'm best at. And, uh, you know, love it a lot. Next year, I'm going to be going to the Eastman School of Music up in Rochester, New York, um, where, uh, you know, my major will be music. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. And, um, you know, I'll see where it takes me from there. You know, Thank you for having us, though. It's fun. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Uh, Northside does have a long history of uh, incredible programming uh, in the arts and music. So really appreciate we had to work the schedule a little bit uh, for their availability. But we appreciate you being here this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Mr. Justice, I think you might have outdone yourself. That literally brought <laughs> tears to my eyes. <laughs> and it great. was just very, very special. What two great young gentlemen, and we wish them the best of luck in their future endeavors. So that was fantastic. Well done. <laughs> okay, um, we now have uh, two presentations, and I'll come down to the dais. Two very special presentations this morning, and um, the first one is Emergency Medical Services Week Proclamation. So I'd like to ask <coughs> Dr. Eric Carver, Chairman of the Pinellas County EMS Advisory Council, and Craig Hare, who is Director of EMS and Fire Administration. So welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see Good you. To see thank you. you for your service. Yeah, thank you. Hi. You too. Um, in 1980, a countywide referendum catalyzed public support for the creation of the Pinellas County Emergency Medical Services Authority, acronym EMS, and set the foundation for our high-performance EMS system. <coughs> National Emergency Medical Services Week is an opportunity for all of us to reflect on the dedicated efforts of our EMS system personnel who provide compassionate quality care and service to our community each and every day. The high skill level and professionalism of our emergency medical dispatchers, 
our emergency medical technicians, and our paramedics have enabled the EMS system to attain clinical excellence in trauma and medical care. The long-standing partnerships with our local fire rescue agencies for paramedic first response, the countywide paramedic ambulance service, and our local hospitals allow emergency medical services to be provided seamlessly. Emergency medical services has a substantial impact on public health, safety, and welfare through the care of the sick and injured citizens in our community. So National Emergency Services Week brings together our community and our EMS providers to celebrate their accomplishments and also to rededicate ourselves to compassionate quality care and service. So now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that the week of May the 19th through May 25th, 2019, be recognized as Emergency Medical Services Week. Thank you. No, it's an honor to serve and be able to support the citizens of Pinellas County and thank you and all the members here for being able to, for your continued support of EMS. Uh, we have a very large EMS system compared comparatively nationally and uh, these are the folks that are going to be in your living rooms at 2 in the morning taking care of your family. So please keep that in mind and uh, honored to serve. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, ma'am. Uh, really, it's an honor to accept this on behalf of our over 1,900 uh, dispatchers, EMTs, paramedics, nurses, physicians, all of our partners, including the college. Uh, uh, Dr. Carver oversees our, our EMS program at the college. Um, it's just an honor to have us accept uh, this and, and bring it back on behalf of everyone. Thank you. Well, again, thank you, um, as he mentioned, to 1,900 of our own um, personnel that service tirelessly each and every day. We are so appreciative. Um, I think each one of us have been touched in some way by um, one of these 1900 personnel and we're ex very, very grateful. So thank you. Okay, and so um, with this being Emergency Medical Services Week, it is also the time of year when we are so um, happy and pleased to recognize the Emergency Medical Services Professionals of the Year. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that the Pinellas Federal Credit Union has supported the Emergency Medical Services Professionals of the Year Award for 29 straight years since the first awards were given in 1990. Ms. Lauren Weeder, um, AVP of Branch Operations, and Ms. Monica Lukasik, Marketing Specialist, are here to help us present the awards and give a gift to each award recipient. Could you join me here at the podium? Lauren. Oops. Okay. And I'm sure I mispronounced your last name. Luke Hasek. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so each year, the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners recognizes the three individuals named Emergency Medical Services Professional of the Year. So first, we'll play a video that will introduce these emergency <laughs> medical professionals and highlight their award-winning efforts. Every day, Pinellas County's emergency medical services staff are answering calls and saving lives. We recognize their dedication through the EMS Professionals of the Year Awards. This year, three individuals stood out as 2019's EMS Professionals of the Year. Her unique style of patient care and compassion at stressful times is why Maya Daniels is this year's Sunstar Paramedic of the Year. When answering a call, the six-year veteran thinks of her late grandmother, whom she cared for while in EMT school. 
I always think this could be my family member, this could be someone that I know that I love, and that, that's kind of the mindset that I go into with it, is you have to show care and compassion to every single person because you never know what they're going through or who loves them because they're loved by someone. Her experience shows in her ability to keep patients calm in high stakes situations. When training new medics, she passes on her philosophy. Just remember the reason that we're there and that they called 911 because they needed someone and right now you're that someone. Actions taken during a 911 call can make or break a medical emergency. Offering extraordinary public service from the regional 911 center is why Kathy Boucher is telecommunicator of the year. He's unresponsive, his eyes just roll back. All right, we have paramedics on the way. Stay on the line with me. In September, Kathy put her 12 years of experience into action during that call. A patient stopped breathing during dispatch. Listen carefully and I'm gonna tell you how to do chest compressions. She One, coached the patient's two, friend over the phone to perform CPR One, two, until paramedics that's came. Great. Keep that pace. Ultimately, saving his life. Me and my caller did everything that we could with what we were given. I couldn't have done it without my caller. There's no way. If I had any pushback, anything like that, the outcome wouldn't be the same. And then after that, you know, rescue, St. Pete Fire Rescue, Sunstar, all the staff at the hospital, like it's it should be an award for everybody. EMT of the year, Kyle Turner, says he loves the unpredictability of his job. On a daily basis, Kyle applies his extensive medical knowledge on each call. Kyle thinks fast in unfamiliar situations and stays calm when a transport escalates, quickly knowing how to apply the correct life-saving protocol. We were taking a, a patient out of county, so we are heading over the bridge to Tampa during rush hour traffic, and our, my patient started to seize on me in the back of the truck. I put oxygen on her, take vitals every five minutes. She didn't really wake up until we got to the hospital. And then by the time I left, it was really great because she was able to talk to me and, and have a conversation with me. And it was great to see a good outcome. Kyle may not have even entered the field if it weren't for a snake bite in sixth grade. A friend's father from Seminole Fire treated him. From then on, Kyle wanted to save lives in the community where he grew up. It's a great feeling when you know the people that are working on you. This county is unbelievable. Everybody is top notch. The Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners congratulates Maya Daniels, Kathy Boucher, and Kyle Turner, the 2019 EMS Professionals of the Year. And on behalf of the county, thank you to all of our emergency professionals for your service. I'd first like to ask Kathy Boucher to join me at the podium. Kathy? <laughs> Kathy is a 911 telecommunicator with Regional 911. She is a 12 year county employee who was recently promoted to 911 quality assurance specialist. Kathy is being recognized for her calm and professional handling of a 911 call for chest pain in which the patient became unresponsive. <laughs> stopped breathing, and lost their pulse. Kathy instructed the patient's friend how to do CPR over the phone while fire rescue and Sunstar responded. The patient survived. Friends of the patient said, she is a rock star. A huge cheerleader who made all the difference in the world. She saved our friend's life. Next, I'd like to ask, well, let's do these one at a time, because um, family may want to even join in the photos, maybe? <laughs> you want to invite your family up? Everybody? Come on up. It looks like there's a little one here, too.
Okay, looks good. One, two, three. One second, please. One, two, three. Come, thank you. Next, I'd like to ask Kyle Turner to join us here at the podium. Kyle has been with Sunstar for two years. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Kyle is being recognized for his overall professionalism, positive attitude, and being a role model as a field training officer. Kyle was caring for a patient during a routine transport when suddenly the patient became unstable and had a seizure. Kyle immediately became, began supportive care and directed his partner to transport um, the emergency to the closest hospital. Kyle, thank you. Would you like to say anything? Sure. <laughs> thank you all very much for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, my family's been in Clearwater since the 1800s, so it means a lot for me to be able to be up in front of everybody in Pinellas County that we've lived in for so long and to be able to serve you guys. So thank you very much. Oh, cool. So you'll have to visit his family's um, ancestral home. It is now in Heritage Village, the Turner Bungalow. So, boy, this is really special. It's not open yet. So they won't let you in yet. <laughs> They're working on it. They're trying to get it restored. I so. think for me to do the work for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Come on up, family. And finally, I'd like to ask um, Maya Daniels to join us here at the podium. And Maya's been with Sunstar for seven years. Welcome. Nice to see you. Would you like to say anything? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> After that video, I'll spare you. Uh, <laughs> I just want to thank my mother for always teaching me love and compassion above all else. And thank you to JP and Richard and Leslie for always supporting me. And thank you guys. That's it. So Maya is being recognized as a compassionate caregiver who serves as a field training officer and a role model. She teaches paramedics and EMTs how to have a caring and compassionate approach to their patients. Maya said, being a paramedic gives the, her purpose not just because of the interesting medical cases or the glow of the lights, but because we as paramedics come at the most vulnerable and fragile time in a person's life and how true that is. Thank you. Come on up, family. <laughs> okay, we count. One, two, three. I just 
want to say, um, as on behalf of Pinellas Federal Credit Union, we're just very proud to be a part of this every year. Um, we love to recognize your dedication and your compassion. And again, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for doing this for 29 years. That's pretty incredible. And as you can see, we certainly have very, very special um, folks that were recognized today. But we, again, want to thank all 1,900 of our personnel who we are so fortunate in Pinellas County to have such high quality care and such compassionate care. So thanks to everyone. Next, we have our public hearings, and we will begin. We are sitting as the countywide planning authority, and we will start with agenda item four. Agenda items four and five are proposed amendments to the countywide plan map. The public hearings are properly advertised after David the publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matters are properly before the authority to be heard. This is a public hearing. Um, I don't have any cards of anyone who wishes to speak on this agenda item, but again, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak? And I'll close the public hearing. Move approval. Second. Okay, motion, motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Welch. Welch? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, We'll pull, pull up the um, voting ballot, please. <coughs> Mine's. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, and unanimous approval. Um, moving on to agenda item five. Um, that covered both of those items. What I read covered both of those items. Pardon me? Her announcement covered both. I can't hear. She covered both of the announcement already. Oh, so I'm sorry. Yes. Whoops. Okay, then I guess that was um, for I agenda item five. But again, I just want to make sure there's no one in the audience who wishes to speak post haste. Well, sorry about that. Okay. Moving on to agenda. Me. We didn't I vote, though. Vote on on uh, I know. We didn't vote on both. Okay, so I'll okay. take a motion. Yeah. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Welch, and we'll put up the voting ballots. Okay, unanimous approval. Uh, very good. Agenda item six. Item six is proposed ordinance amending Chapter 2, Article 5 of the Pinellas County Code related to purchasing. The public hearing was properly advertised. Affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay, this is a public hearing. I'll first ask if there's anybody in the audience who wishes to speak on this agenda item. Okay, then we'll close the public hearing. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I apologize for the late notice. I sent an email out last night, but staff did um, put some um, proposed language in that I'd like to add uh, on the, uh, I legislated it's in green. And the um, hard copy is being passed out now. It's the first underlying uh, red paragraph. And I simply think it's important. And um, Jewel, you can jump in, but I think the reason this change is needed is because there was there were references to minority and female uh, participation, which isn't backed by a disparity study. And that's been there since the 80s. Um, but I think the intent of that paragraph is important that we are committed to um, equal opportunity, supplier diversity, and equity. And so I would ask that we um, add the language in that first paragraph that I've uh, suggested. 
I thank you for the amended language. Um, I think it is more inclusive and, and much better. So any questions, Commissioner Eggers? Yeah, just on the, uh, after the word, all of its citizens, um, would it be appropriate to add and, uh, and businesses? Where, where would you? Just right. after the word citizens, just add the word and businesses. I think that's a good addition. Okay. So I would uh, incorporate that in the amended language. Move approval as amended, Madam Chair. Okay. Second, okay. and can I make one other comment? Pardon me? Second, and then can I make one other comment? Okay. Um, I'd like to recognize Commissioner Justice. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question. Uh, I fully support the, the legislative intent that we're adding in. I think it makes a lot of sense for what we're trying to accomplish. The only question I had is towards the uh, end, where it's uh, we're talking about that the um, this program may depart from otherwise uh, applicable provisions governing bidder eligibility. I, I guess I wanted to know how far we were going off track with bidder eligibility and what that really meant. The intent here is obviously to bring in small businesses. This is not going to vary from eligibility in a manner that would make the vendor unqualified, obviously. So it's they're, they're small changes. Some of the um, some of the changes that you'll see are some of the thresholds for the dollar value, for instance, um, of goods and services that we may pr be procuring, which frankly need to be brought into line with 2019. Um, as Commissioner Welch alluded to, this ordinance has been on the books for a very, very long time now, so many of the changes are meant to really bring it in line with today's standards. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't sure. opening the door too wide for those that weren't qualified or that maybe weren't eligible based on other things that we had de deemed appropriate. If I can, there as part of the shelter program, uh, there's still a qualification and review. Okay. So just because you're qualified under the sheltered market program doesn't mean you're necessarily going to, you know, get the award unless you're qualified and have competitive pricing. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So um, Commissioner Long made the motion. Commissioner Welch seconded it. And did have a with comment. the... Um, I did have a comment, though. I'm sorry? I did have a comment. Okay. I just want to, for the record, we are adding, so the Board of County Commissioners recognizes that the county's growth and prosperity depends on the full participation of all of its citizens and businesses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Welch. And is firmly committed, you know, that sentence goes on. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I was I just, just at, highlighting the change of adding and businesses. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just thought it was ironic that we had, you know, this very strong language um, since the 80s, but our execution was not strong. Now we have, I think, very strong execution on the part of Barry and Cynthia and her whole team in moving forward. And I just wanted to recognize that, that we are really moving in the right direction. And this is really just a clean up, clean up of language that's been there since the 80s. So I just wanted to state that. And um, thank you, Commissioner Long, I mean, Commissioner Welch, for um, bringing this forward and um, for your championship of this issue. I do think it's very important, and I, I'm glad that we're making the changes because I think it is uh, much broader and more inclusive. Thank you, and I thank the Commission for your strong support as well. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to also recognize Dr. Johnson to come up and introduce herself. That she worked very, very hard on yeah. this. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Cynthia Johnson. I am the Senior Director of the Small Business Development Center in Economic Development. And I cannot tell you how excited I am to spearhead the SBE initiative and how ironic that is National Small Business Week. So <laughs> congratulations no. to all our small businesses. This is just the beginning of a lot of wonderful things to come. So thank you all for your support. And um, we're moving right along, so I'm very excited. We are too. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for all your hard work. You. <coughs> okay, with that, um, the motion, again, is um, by Commissioner Long and seconded by Commissioner Welch as amended. Um, go ahead and the voting cards are up. And that is unanimous approval. Thank you again, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam. Agenda item seven. Item seven is a quasi-judicial petition to vacate. All those wishing to give testimony in that item, please stand and take those. 
you swear to tell the truth in the testimony you're about to give, signify by saying I do? Thank you. Quasi judicial petition to vacate submitted by Philip L. F. Melson and Bonnie J. Melson for a portion of a 15 foot drainage easement lying within lot 7, block 1, Manning Oaks subdivision. The public hearing was properly advertised. Affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No letters of no objection have been received from the appropriate parties. All interested parties have been notified as to the date of the public hearing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay. And the two cards I have are um, obviously in favor from Bonnie and Philip Melson. Um, is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on this agenda item? Okay. Approval. Second. Okay. Um, motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Welch. Um, I'm closing the public hearing and we'll go ahead and vote. Unanimous approval. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, agenda item eight. Item eight is also a quasi-judicial petition to vacate. Um, those wishing to give testimony, please stand and take the oath. You swear to tell the truth in the testimony you're about to give, signified by saying I did. This is a quasi-judicial petition to vacate submitted by Avic K. Gangley and Paramita C. Gangley for a portion of a drainage, utility, and or natural area easement lying in block eight, lying in lot eight, block A, Lake St. George, Unit 1, Subdivision. The public hearing was properly advertised. Affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Letters of no objection have been received from the appropriate parties. All interested parties have been notified as to the date of the public hearing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. I have no cards um, for this agenda item for speaking. Um, <coughs> is there anyone in the audience who does wish to speak? Okay, I'll close the public hearing. With approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Gerard. Um, any questions? <coughs> Okay, we'll pull up the voting cards, please. Unanimous approval, congratulations. <coughs> Thank you. Next we go to the consent agenda, which is items nine through 12. Does anyone wish to have anything pulled? 11. 11. Anything else? Okay, then can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda absent agenda item 11? So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. A motion by Commissioner Welch, second by um, Commissioner Gerard. Thank you. Okay, unanimous approval. Uh, moving to agenda item 11, <coughs> Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just think a, a brief presentation is in order. It's, a, I think, a pretty big deal for uh, the airport yes. and the county. So, I agree. That is here, the deputy director. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? My name is Evette Ailey, and I'm the deputy director for finance and administration at the airport. And you're right, Commissioner Justice, this is a very big deal for us. We've been working on this project since April of 2018, where we held an information briefing and had over 50 people attend our meeting just to kind of introduce the process of going out to bid for a master concessionaire to provide not only food beverage but also retail one concessionaire rather than several and after that we went out to bid in september of 2018 and it's taken us all this time to finally get everything together and we have an agreement and we have a a vendor that is going to spend over four million dollars in capital improvement to put um, various retail and food and beverage areas in the three areas of our airport. Um, in ticketing A, which is gates two through six, there's gonna be three daughters brewing, a Dunkin' Donuts, as well as a retail space. And in gates seven through 11, or ticketing B, there's gonna be Mazzaro's Italian Market. Yay, I'm really excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> as well as a retail space. 
And Three Daughters Brewing we're very excited about also because surprisingly we had a lot of input saying we'd like to have craft beers out at the airport. And so we, we will. And in the pre-security, we'll also have a Dunkin' Donuts area as well as a concession area, a retail area, and then a full-service restaurant on the second floor across from the administrative uh, offices, which will be called the District Pub. And these are all of the areas that are going to be input, and it'll take about seven months from the notice to proceed, and the contractors will be at work. And you know, we've been under construction now for a couple of years, so this is not going to be anything new. <laughs> but there will also be temporary food and beverage and retail. It's not going to be completely closed while this area is going on. They are going to make sure that we have um, customer service from the beginning. And the contract will begin on June 1st, if you approve this. Um, and it is also a lot of money to the airport as well. Um, we get $1.2 million in our minimum annual guarantee or percentage of, of the um, gross sales, whichever is larger. And that amount increases a little bit every year. And it's a 10-year agreement with one five-year extension, which is at the, at the county administrator's um, approval. So I am here for any questions you well, want Mr. to Mr. Administrator, you better go taste the food and make sure it's <laughs> <laughs> up to your standards. <laughs> Maybe you have to go to the brewing company, too. But. Ah. <laughs> Great. Commissioner Justice. Thank you. Um, so I guess the one question I did have is the vendors that you mentioned, those are signed or those are still prospective? No, those are signed. Okay. That's a huge deal. Mazzaro's, if you know Mazzaro's family, is very cautious and conservative about expanding. So this is a huge get. So yeah. appreciate your time. I am so excited. I was just there uh, about a week ago. <laughs> Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is a, a, um, a very strong package for the county, uh, and I will support it. The one question that I had, and most of y'all know, I, I pretty much live at Kawa Coffee. <laughs> and um, uh, Ms. Bristol can attest to that. We just met there a couple of days ago. Um, you know, I was excited to see Mazzaro's and Three Daughters, you know, supporting local businesses, and just wondered uh, why Kawa didn't make it versus Duncan. And my understanding is that these were two package deals. There were basically. two different packages. So right. Kawa was not ever in contact that, with Hudson, who actually ultimately won the contract. Right. Okay. I do have members from Hudson here in case you'd like to ask them about branding because that's not, it wasn't part of our, of, of our package. We just said we need you to bring your brands together when we see the bids, the RFPs, and that was not part of their package. But we do have folks here that are here from branding. My only question would be, question. did they look at any local uh, coffee vendors, coffee stores? Because just like... <laughs> Three Daughters and Mazzaro's, we have a very strong... Right. Um, well, Mazzaro's will be serving coffee on the 7 to 11 because we don't have a Duncan in that area, but Duncan will be both pre-security and also in ticketing A. Okay. So was any thought given to any local coffee businesses? Why don't we invite the folks from Hudson okay. to come up and introduce themselves and answer the questions? Before they do, Commissioner uh -huh. Seal, um, one of the requests that we made um, when Tim came and made this proposal to us was that there be a very strong focus on local restaurants and not big chains. Mm -hmm. So White Commissioner Welch, I'm a little, I mean, I'm glad about Three Daughters Brewing and Massaro's, but I'm very curious about the response from the group from Hudson. Two and three. Thank you. I'm Mike Blake, we Senior Vice President of Business Development for the Hudson Group. And this gentleman here. I'm Michael Caveney, uh, uh, Director of uh, Brands and Concepts for SSP America. One of the things we try to always do when we're looking at concepts for any market is a, a well orchestrated and curated blend of local as well as national. Um, and in this package, because we're, we're in this together as an overall company, we believe we've done that. Uh, so you see local brands that were presented. Obviously, Duncan's a very much national brand. Uh, on the retail side, which I can speak to, we had local inspired concepts like a Market 361, Sand in the Sky, blended with Hudson, which is our proprietary travel convenience store where there's 450 of those in North America. So it's trying to be a balanced concept of not only local, which you see, but also national as well. So it was a combination that we looked for. Question, Madam Chair? Mm -hmm. So did, was it ever an opportunity for local coffee shops to compete? Or were you locked with Duncan? No, I mean, Star. we looked at um, what we're trying to, to Michael's point, what we try to do is balance a local and regional 
brands, which, which we did with Bizarro and Three Daughters Brewing, mm -hmm. as well as nationally recognized brands, uh, which also help drive revenue for the for the airport. Uh, so, I would say that uh, we just we thought Duncan was was uh, well suited for the airport and giving it national recognition for uh, so, the same piece. So did local shops have a chance to compete or not? Did you look at local or was it we, just We certainly did. I mean, as, as, I, as I looked at um, Three Daughters and Mazzaro's, um, you know, we, we considered uh, local coffee as well, um, but we just felt that uh, Duncan offered uh, a national recognition that the travelers would uh, well suited for the travelers. One other question, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. So, we know where Mazzaro's is, we know where Three Daughters is. Mm -hmm. I was going to say they're both in, in District 7, but I didn't, I didn't say that. You could. Um, so where is this Duncan, it, I mean, where is the Duncan location that will be providing this service? Is it, is it a local Duncan presence or? No, no, it's a national, I mean, it's, it's going to be uh, run by our organizations. Um, and it, so it's, it's a nationally. It's not a local individual that's going to be running the, the Duncans. Okay. Uh, can I ask our staff a question? So is it outside of our purchasing procedures, regulations, at this point to state a preference for a local coffee vendor? I've asked Joe to come up to that question. Joe Lord, Director of Purchasing. Commissioner, I don't think it's outside of it. The board can do it as they see fit. That's why it's, it's presented before you for consideration. But there's obviously a deal in place, so you have to take that into consideration as well. But no, okay. it's, it, it, that's why it's before you. Okay, Joe. Well, I, I, um, I, I, I like all the other aspects of this, but I just, uh, local matters, and we made that statement early going into this. And uh, Duncan is like, you know, Starbucks. Um, it doesn't present that local flavor, and we've got local... We just talked about small businesses. We've got a local business that is more than capable. Mm -hmm. And I have no financial interest in Kawa, to state the record. They, got, they have my money. Um, <laughs> I just have an issue with that. I, I think we can have a, a strong um, partnership going forward, but that Kawa versus Duncan uh, is worrisome to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Um, uh, respectfully, I, I tend to uh, agree with the, the folks that are here that talk about bringing a, bringing a balance. Now, I'm not, I'm not the one that understands what that balance should be, but I certainly understand the benefit of having a national presence. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, it does bring traffic. It does bring, quote, credibility uh, that, that may not know the local folks. At the same time, I want to give all, all all the possibilities to them, so to our to our local uh, companies. But I think the balance is really critical. So I would just ask maybe if you could just take a minute to speak to a, the number of businesses that you're going to have there in your package deal, and so what that which ones are local, which ones are national. If you could just take a minute to do that, uh, because you could have all kinds of combinations of these locals and nationals. I think the ones you've brought forward are very strong and very sound. So I'm, I'm uh, likely to support it, but I just, maybe you could speak to the, to the entire packet of types. Sure, from a food and beverage, from food and beverage perspective, uh, we're going to have uh, four locations. There's uh, two locals, one national and one proprietary brand, uh, which is the district pub, which allows us to create a flexible menu uh, designed for the travelers, uh, specifically here in St. Pete's. Um, so it's kind of a, a balance across the board, but certainly weighted toward uh, local brands with Bizarro's and Three Daughters. Yeah, thank you. And on the, oh, I'm sorry. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. the, uh, the folks that are going to be owning and or operating the district pub, mm -hmm. are those folks local? Uh, the reason I ask is because along with Commissioner Welch's concerns <coughs> about local presence, we have some extraordinary, really extraordinary restaurateurs in our county that are highly recognized in the world of restaurants and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm curious about if any of those folks either had an opportunity to be considered or are involved with the district pub. They're, they're not, there are not local um, owners in, involved in the district pub. Um, and again, there's only so many spaces that we had to, to work with in the airport. Um, 
So we, we just have to try to make a business decision for what's best for the travelers. Uh, well, we'll then I, may I ask you what your criteria was for bringing the district pub? I don't know anything about them. Sure. I mean, we, when we look at this, so we go through and we look at the zone. We basically look at the traffic patterns by zone um, and try to understand you know, what the travelers, the use of the space, it's pre-security, it's upstairs, the amount of passengers going through. Um, so we try to make a, a balanced decision on um, what's the what, how 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 best to support the, the travelers coming through. I'm John Good morning. Clark. Come I'm, in. Uh, I'm one of the introduce uh, yourself. Come forward. And John Clark, SSP America, Vice President of Business Development. Um, just a little brief to probably help put this in context. SSP is probably the large, considered the largest um, food and beverage beverage operator in the world. Um, we're a global company. We came in, we partnered with Hudson. Hudson invited us to come in and really begin to look at the landscape on the food and beverage side. Looking at the criteria that was established in the RFP, we thought that bringing um, a bit of local and a bit of national made, made it create the type of environment that we took away from both the meetings and the um, solicitation process. Through that, looking at the level of investment and the opportunity for making sure that that four and a half million dollars is paid back um, and being able to provide a level of service that this community will be proud of. So there was both the customer experience, there was the financial aspect of this that kind of brought the combination of why a national brand, why a proprietary brand, because we actually create brands. We are a very large company, about four and a half billion dollars a year worldwide. And so we are in the restaurant business and we <coughs> measured this market and determined that as a growth market, this gives us an opportunity to really put a program in place that will bring a level of customer service, probably different than you've seen in the, in the past. We, we, we truly believe that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it was trying to find a balance. The good news to it is, is that there is enough time in the agreement, and as you see us perform, there may be opportunities to bring in a coffee down the road that is a local brand. Um, so we just want to make sure that the airport is receiving the, the type of revenues that it's expecting, and we want to be also able to deliver the type of service um, and customer experience that the people of this community would expect. Any further questions? I think um, you've heard what the county commission is concerned about, and <clears throat> the past. I I guess that you all are investing the capital. Yes. So um, that does. We would like the opportunity as you see fit. Um, at least I'm summarizing this. Hopefully that you could bring in some local coffee or and or other beverage companies. Yes. Move approval. Okay, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will not be supporting this. Uh, I think overall it's a good effort. But my takeaway is that you never really looked at local coffee vendors. And that's, that's what concerns me. Um, having lived here all my life, I know that, that uh, Kawa is a vendor that's known throughout this county. And I, the other thing I would add is that TIA specifically made an effort to have local at Tampa International. And so this is a new ground we're breaking. And so um, I, I'm supportive of what you're doing. I think overall the concept is good. This piece concerns me. I don't think a local company really was ever on your radar. It is now, and hopefully in the future they can have some opportunity. But uh, for those reasons, I won't be supporting this today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, um, unfortunately, because I love what's going on out at the airport and I want to do everything that I can to support it, but I cannot support this list because we clearly stated in the beginning that we really wanted local folks to be considered, number one. Number two, this is a very tourist-oriented community, and we have a lot of um, uh, identity tied up in the types of food that we serve here. And while I'm not fixated on the Kawa Coffee Commissioner Welch issue, it is just one. Because what'd you say? I said you need to drink more coffee. You don't think I'm hyper enough? Not already? at all. Jeez, not at all. Really. <laughs> um, 
so he's focused on the coffee. I'm focused on the food food side of it as well. And I would like to see some of our local folks have an opportunity to present and be have a presence at the York airport. So I will not be supporting it either for that reason. Commissioner Eggers. Um, well, I think they did bring a local pr a presence to this package deal. We, again, let's keep in mind that there's an investment in place and there's a return asked. So if we're going to do this kind of micromanaging as I see it, then I think we need to allow them the opportunity to change uh, that return possibility because, quite frankly, um, I do think that we have a lot of tourists coming in here who do have recognition for national brands that uh, so it's not just local folks that are experiencing the airport it's also our visitors coming in so it's really important for a company because you know in the write-up I was sitting here trying to under trying to figure out who is spending the four and a half million dollars to fix the place up because it really wasn't clear in here and uh, when I found out that uh, you all were doing it I think it the, the formula has to fit so that the, the capital investment is, is protected. And so, again, if we're going to go down a different path, and, and I'm going to support this because I think this is a great package, I think it's great for Pinellas County, I think it's great for our visitors, then I would say that we need to open the thing back up and give them an opportunity to look at their numbers again. Because despite your preference for that coffee, I would venture to say that more people in this county drink the other coffee. And I'm not, I'm not even, I'm just saying from a national brand perspective, in a balance to what we're trying to do at our airport, I think this is the right package. Now, there may be other right packages that do that, that mix that we could look at. I don't want to get into that. That's, that's what they brought forward. So anyway, I just think if we're going to go down that path and start going and start looking into, the, into this, then we need to open it all back up again. So I'm going to support what's on the table. And do we have a motion yet? Yes. Um, yeah, we do. Yeah, we Commissioner do. Justice made a motion. I'm not sure if I had a second. Uh, Commissioner Gerard is the second. And I'd like to recognize you to speak. Yeah, I, I am going to support this. I think I love Mazzaro's and I love, well, I don't go to Three Daughters Brewing because I don't drink. but um, And I love Cal. However, I think... I think you're right that most of the people that come through the airport are going to recognize Dunkin' Donuts a lot faster than they do Kawa. And frankly, I'm just glad it's not Starbucks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate Starbucks coffee. <laughs> Commissioner Justice and Commissioner Welch and then Commissioner Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple years ago when Tampa Airport went out, uh, their bid process was much more complicated, much more complex, uh, a lot more lawyers involved. Um, <laughs> The thing to notice is that this went out in our typical process. There were two bids. The bid that scored second by a considerable amount also called for a blend of local and national. I don't know. When these go out, these companies start going out and they'll hit every local place they can, have conversations, uh, some that have a history of doing this kind of thing, some that have never thought about having a presence at an airport. And they go out and interview and meet those folks. And so I don't know if they met with Kawa or not, but um, to me to have Mazaros, to have three daughters is a good a taste of Pinellas County, and so I think it's a good blend, and that's why I'm supporting it. You actually say a good blend before <laughs> it comes back to me. I, I just want to say I, I respectfully would disagree, and Commissioner Eggers, with one thing you said. This is not about my personal preference. That's not what it's about. It's about um, a local well. business having access to that. And if you want to talk about the numbers, you know, we don't know that Dunkin' Donuts is the one piece of this that makes this financially viable. Uh, folks that walk through that airport probably haven't seen Three Daughters Brewing either. Probably don't know what Mazzaro's is. So I just disagree with you that the Dunkin' piece is the piece that makes or breaks it. And I just want to state this is not about my personal preference. It's about the concept of local businesses having a chance to um, be a part of the process and be looked at. So I just wanted to state that. Thank you. Commissioner Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I appreciate everything you're saying, Commissioner, but um, even TIA has a combination. So they got a P.F. Chang's. They have a rum fish, which is local, but they have a P.F. Chang's. 
And um, so I think you have to have that mix and that balance. Um, and I think the one thing I worry about is now that you've picked out one particular company, if they came back from Kawa, have we now depicted what company we want it to be? And, and I'm, I'm afraid that we might cross that line, and that worries me. Um, sure, Kawa is a great product, absolutely. Um, but I think just like TIA had to have that mix, I think Pi has to have that same mix. So um, I do lean with that main restaurant with uh, Commissioner Long over there. I would have loved to have seen one of our restaurateurs over there. Um, but I think you all do a good job, and, and in the future when the next contract comes up, you may choose, or in midway you might want to choose uh, to shift that up. But, um, but I think the balance is important just like TIA did it. So thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I think you heard our concerns, and as things evolve, perhaps you'll be able to change the mix. Um, but I also um, want to comment that um, I was at the grand opening of the new retail area at Tampa International Airport recently, and that is a national vendor who's running a great deal of their retail and um, in, the, in the main air, terminal area. And as well, you know, they have Hard Rock Cafe and P.F. Chang's, and, but then they've also had the local mix. So obviously they have to look at the numbers and they have to do their best analysis as to what's going to work. And so um, <clears throat> I thank you all. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am to finally have some decent food that'll be at that airport. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, <laughs> and some choices. So um, anyway, I've close this and we'll go ahead and uh, take I, a vote. Can I make one last comment, Commissioner yes. Seal? So given the conversations that I've heard since I made my remark, I'm going to support it today reluctantly just because I feel so strongly that it, it's yeah. our airport the bit and we should have more of our identity and a there. So for whenever you have another opportunity, God willing, I hope you will consider the comments that have been made today. Thank you. See? Okay. I'm not rigid. <laughs> Go ahead and vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work. No problem. And please let us know when it's ready to open. We will. Okay. Oh, yeah. Are you going to have a grand opening? We're, absolutely. Okay. It'll be a big party. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. About seven months. Okay, it um, passes six to one. And uh, thank you all very much for the good discussion. Thank you. Okay. Agenda item 13. Agenda item 13 is compliance and eligibility review of current work development tax capital project funding uh, program applications. Uh, five applications were timely received for consideration. The City of Clearwater's oh, yeah, okay. um, retrain spring training facility for the Phillies, Dolly Museum, American Craftsman Museum, St. Petersburg Museum of History, and Tampa Bay Watch Discovery Center. Okay, um, I, what I'd like to do is probably take um, the American Craft, the, each of the remaining three that haven't already been heard by us and go individually through each one. And so that way we can um, consider them and ask specific questions. I know we tasked the county attorney with um, talking with the um, city of St. Petersburg's attorneys about some of the lease provisions and so on. Um, so let's start with the American Craftsman Museum, and <coughs> as noted by, um, that's a $2 million request. It appears to be an updated resubmittal of their last funding cycle application. There does not appear to be any new grounds, data, or changes to the project that result in new or additional tourism impacts that would justify an additional award of funding. So, um, anybody want to comment or? Make a case one way or the other? Well, your line? <clears throat> I'm not going to be redundant, because you, except for Commissioner Peters, who wasn't here, you've all heard my resistance to this particular appropriation to begin with, number one. Number two, um, I just... I just have a really hard time supporting this particular application given all of the other issues that surround this application. And I don't want to be, you know, again, snarky, but I just don't think it 
fits with our mission and objectives. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I just, I guess, being that there's no changes to the application and they were given an award last year, that was, and it wasn't because of a lack of <coughs> funds that we didn't award them more. It was just that we didn't want to. So it's kind of disingenuous to come back. Commissioner Justice and Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I think it's a, uh, um, I supported it last year or two years ago whenever we did it. Um, I think it's going to be a uh, world-class facility when it's open uh, shortly. And I think it was worthy of the funds that we gave it before. Uh, but I think that is the appropriate amount at this time. Commissioner Welch. Uh, I agree. I, I did support uh, the last one, and I think we went through a process. understand where you are uh, on that, Commissioner Long. But I think this time it looks like the increase is just based on an increase in tourism and bed nights. And if we apply that to every project, every project could come back just based on our growth in tourism and ask for an adjustment. So for that reason, I, I don't support this request either. Okay. I'd like to go ahead and have a motion. Um, again on each individual project so that it's clear. So um, I hear that, um, I believe that most would not like to approve this, so if I could have a motion that that. I move that this application be denied. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Com Commissioner Long made the motion. Commissioner Eggers did a second. This is to deny the American Craftsman Museum. Um, and again, I just want it to be clear as it goes back to the um, museum that this is, we just don't agree that there's um, additional data to support um, additional funding. But we also are very pleased and look forward to their grand opening. And so that motion is just for that item. This it's, it's not that's not that, yeah, it's not yeah. what that reads, but. Right. The motion is to deny. To deny. Yeah. Okay. It's unanimous approval to deny this application. Let's move on to the St. Petersburg Museum of History. Can we hear from the attorney about? Yeah. Sure. Some of the questions that you all raised last time were in regard to the length of the lease. And your guidelines set out um, very specifically some minimum length requirements depending on whether it's a, an improvement or renovation or new construction. So the conversation that we had in regard to the Museum of History last time was in regard to that, that museum, uh, I'm sorry, in regard to the lease length. I think that um, the questions were, could we enter into a new lease sooner than the expiration, which would be in 2022? Um, the city is planning to enter into a new lease this spring. I think that you all received a letter from Mayor Kreisman that really essentially answered the question, I think, very well, um, that they are, in fact, planning to enter into a new lease with the museum this spring. Uh, it's not quite ready yet because they're working on some footprint issues and some other things that I do think are necessary uh, to make... Um, to make a good lease and that they are then going to look in the future to have um, a referendum before the voters that would allow a longer lease for the museum. I think another important fact to note that is again in the mayor's letter is the length of time the museum has been there since 1921 for 98 years. So even with a new lease uh, to be entered into this spring 2019 it would still be 10 years. It still does not meet your guidelines that would call for 20. However, there is information here that does tell you that the museum has been there for nearly 100 years at this point. Question? Yes. So, so we understand the process that we're going through today. The ones that if we approve going forward, even though they don't quite meet our criteria, it goes back to the TDC or go back to our consultant and goes through that whole process and then would come back to us for another vote? That's correct. Correct. So what kind of time frame are we looking at and, and would the city have time at during that time period to simply start a 10-year lease from 19 instead of from 22? My guess, based on the information in the mayor's letter, is that yes, that 10-year that lease originating in 2019 would most likely be done before this would come back to the county commission for a vote. That's my supposition based on the information provided by the mayor. In regard to the future plan to um, have a referendum to allow that 25-year lease, I suspect not, but... Sure, no, the, yeah. the referendum obviously is more challenging, but the 10-year lease, 
seems pretty simple for them to do and would give me a lot more comfort in that time frame okay. rather than just two years. So. Sure. And I'm sure that um, the museum itself would feel um, greater clarity as well since they are raising money to Absolutely. build this museum and working so hard on, <laughs> on this project. So. And what I can say in regard to the question raised, we did get confirmation from the city attorney's office that they are working on that, and again, um, bolstered by the letter from Mayor Kreisman. I have a question. I'm sure I yeah, can. so there's folks here who have more history. Um, again, I, there are times that the word precedence is used, um, which I disagree with. In this case, it's just a question. There are um, 23 other cities in the county that have, some of them have museums. Um, the the county has a, a museum up in Palm Harbor. Um, are, I, I haven't seen other museums come forward with asks like this, um, but they are eligible, correct? Mm -hmm. for, all of them are eligible for that, even though it might be proprietary information just for their city, that they're eligible to come here for TDC funds if, if and have the same kind of review and critique and all of that so so what we're doing now is just like we've done in the last the, the two items that uh, were mentioned earlier we are just giving it the go ahead to go back and go through the review process correct we're not approving anything today other than that that's correct um, I since we spend money on the consultant to review their economic impact I did not want to waste any money if there was a project that had no in you know, interest or desire by the county commission. So that's why we are discussing them individually today. And <clears throat> remember, um, versus the elite event guidelines, those are set in stone. Mm -hmm. These are for the capital is guidelines. And so they are subject to the county commissions and the tourist development council's waiver if necessary. Um, I think this one in particular, um, has different set of circumstances. Um, other cities might have similar um, waterfront restrictions, and I can think of another city that does. And so therefore, I um, believe that we should look at this with a favorable eye. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one tech point, when we do your refresh, you lose your markups. So I lost all the markups I had on this. That is not uh, funny. And staff did a great job summarizing everything. I'd be supportive of this one moving forward, uh, given the mayor's letter on the lease. Um, it does meet room nights, but not attendance. Um, so I'd like to see that um, explored a little bit. And also the one-to-one um, -one match requirement. There's some questions about that. So those questions need to be answered. But at this point, I'd be supportive of this moving forward. We have representatives from the museum here, if you would like to directly ask the questions about that. Well. I know I talked to Rui yesterday on the phone, and he okay. was going to relook at their application. Okay. You want to come up? Uh, Commissioner Steele, while he's coming up, can I ask Commissioner Welch a question? Commissioner Welch. Yes, ma'am. Is there a save thing that you should have done maybe to keep those notes from going away? Because I make notes too, and I don't want to lose them. The notes stay. The markups go away. The highlights and underlines, mm -hmm. those But is go that away. a quirk? Because why would that, why would they go away? I have to explore that further, but your <laughs> notes are safe. Can you let us know when you I find out? I will definitely do that. I'm really doing good in my learning. You program. are. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. That'd be part Second of today's tech talk, or? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Pinellas Tech. I know. Um, good morning, and could morning. you introduce yourself? Good morning. Hi, my name is Rui Frias. I'm the director of the Museum of History. I'm Howard Johnston. I'm the president of the uh, board of the museum. Lee Allen, treasurer of the Museum of History. Okay. Um, I think on the the attendance part, because uh, when we, we saw the agenda and we read the comment, uh, we were a little confused because we with our consultant, we thought that we had met it. And when we went back and looked at it, we looked at the application, and we think that's maybe where the confusion lies. Because uh, on the application, it talks about a projected annual increase of 76,000 attendees. That was the total number. Um, the actual uh, new tourist number was 50,201, um, which does, according to the application, qualify for increased attendance. Tourist means someone that's... Not from Pinellas County. Tourist is not someone defined in your application as someone doesn't live in Pinellas County. Right. Mm -hmm. And we picked up the total attendance in the application instead of the 
tourists, which is still 52,000, which exceeds the 25,000 right. requirement in the application. We're still not sure why it was it was in the economic report sent in, but for whatever reason, the review process kicked it out. Okay. We we absolutely meet this requirement. So it's in the economic impact it study. Is. It is, and it's and in it's in all the background just material. Wasn't okay. Stated in the actual application. Correct. So it just had the total amount that. on the actual application page, but okay. all the additional material has it broken down. Great. Fundraising like this. Yeah, and the one-to-one -one match? We, uh, right now, uh, we have a commitment with reserves and commitments of about $1.7 million. Um, and we're in the process of, of a private donor campaign that we just kicked off. And we've had uh, some really good conversations and some uh, people who are looking at some serious commitments now. So, I mean, we feel, we feel comfortable that we'll easily get there by the time. Actually, it's more like $2 million, I think. Yeah, that by the time this is... This okay, comes to so DDC. You think by the time it probably comes back to us, you'll have reached yes. your $2 million goal? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, and you'll have the one-to-one -one match then? Yes. yes. So. Mm -hmm. um, did you consider the value of the land in your match? No, we did not. No, we did not. Okay. No. Then you meet, the, you meet the criteria now as far as I'm concerned because that was one important part of the guideline that I kept in there, that mm -hmm. there is value to the land. Granted, you're leasing it. I was going to say, we're leasing so, it. But, but there is but still a value. Year, a dollar a year is a pretty good lease. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. And the value <laughs> of the lease holds. Kind of yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Well, that's good news, too. Okay. Any other questions for them? We are so excited. Great. I'm excited. Thank you. So, anyway, Thank you, sir, um, I know you all, I, what a wonderful long history of being there in 98 years. And <laughs> um, that's going to be so cool when the new pier opens. And um, all the great things that you all are working on. So thank you for being here today. Thank you very much thank for you. your time. Thanks. Thank thank you. You. Are you looking for a motion? Yes. Or? So I'd move that we the St. Pete Museum of History application moves to the next step. Second. A uh, motion by Commissioner Welch and a second by Commissioner Gerard, and that is to approve the St. Petersburg Museum of History to move forward in the process. Okay, unanimous approval. Very good. Okay, the last one is the Discovery Center. Is there any um, information, Adam Attorney, that you would like to bring forward? Yeah, part of the, uh, some of the questions that I wrote down that you all asked is what would the money go to specifically? Uh, what type of fundraising efforts have they undertaken? Um, as you all know, the pier is obviously being constructed and this would be um, a portion of that pier. What the money the Discovery Center is asking for would go toward the tenant portion of the build out of that space. Um, the breakdown also of the total funds necessary does already show some contributions made from some private foundations and some other individual and corporate support. So they are undertaking uh, some private fundraising in that regard. Now, the other, I don't know how much we spoke about it last time, but of course the other issue is the length of the, the lease, which again is shorter than what your guidelines require. Again, your guidelines, which you can choose to waive if you so, so see fit. I have a question for Jules. So we, um, we asked the city about the lease for the museum, but we didn't ask the city for the lease on the pier? This one was, I think, that there's not the history with this one. Obviously, this is a brand new tenant at a brand new facility right. for the city. Um, the one thing that we did actually discuss with them is that, yes, this uh, location is subject to the same charter restrictions, the city charter, which I believe limits this currently to 10 years. Yeah. We did not get information from the city indicating that they were looking at a longer length, such as with the Museum of History. And, you know, again, this is a new relationship between the city and Tampa Bay Watch, uh, which I don't want to speak for the city, but I would suspect would create a little bit different situation in regard to the relationship as, as between the city and Tampa Bay Watch as opposed to the city and the Museum of History. Can I ask a question about the process? Yes, Commissioner Welch. So if I recall, the city, did the city put this out for bid? Does anyone know? Is, is anyone from the city Tampa here? Tampa Bay Watch is here. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Peter morning. Clark. I'm the president of Tampa Bay Watch. It did go out to bid. We submitted an application to the city 
which in turn they went out for a 30-day notice to see if there was other interested organizations that would apply for it. Ours was accepted. So in your bid, it's good to see you all. In your bid, did you anticipate getting uh, bed tax funding for this part of the project? Um, we, we, do not, we did not want to put all our eggs in one basket, so we have a comprehensive fundraising program for the capital part of the Discovery Center project, as well as the exhibits and the programs for the uh, first year of operation. And these expenses are to be borne by Tampa Bay Watch, not by the city? That's correct. Okay, because one of the questions I had, this is, uh, keep my funding stream straight, this is funded by TIF from the CRA, correct? The peer project. And one of my questions is, why couldn't this build out be funded from this, the TIF for the peer, especially given the fact that um, this project doesn't meet the room night requirement? The six and it actually does. We are going okay. to come back and resubmit a uh, letter of clarification. But okay. similar to the History Museum, when we saw the comments back from the county, we drilled down into the numbers, and we actually do comply with the requirements. And we'll just go ahead and clarify that. In so a it's not the six thousand. That's okay. correct. It's twelve thousand. It's twelve. Yeah. And what are you based that on? What's the? the we difference? had an independent economic study di done by Lambert Associates, and it was referenced uh, in a couple of different areas, and we included that in our application. But the one that rose to the surface is the 6,000, but it's actually 12,000 tourist room nights. Is that in your application? It is, yes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Another question, sure real quick. <clears throat> On the, uh, since this is going for the tenant improvements, uh, assuming you stay the 10 years, then yes. you've, you've recouped all those dollars. If, if something changes in five years and, and you all move your, you know move out and somebody else comes in, those improvements that we've invested might be torn down? No, or they're actually you, okay. part of the actual building. So those tenant improvements that you're paying for will stay with the building itself. They're to the base building or yes. to the individual things that your tenancy needs? Mm -hmm. So part of the issue is the eastern side of the building was designed by the city as an open-air snack bar. We went to the mayor and said, if you'd like us to create the exhibit hall, the Discovery Center, then we really need to close that area in to be able to utilize it for kids and adult uh, educational programs and tourism in the afternoons and evenings. So that essentially made us responsible for closing in that side of the building. And uh, these TDC funds will help us with that actual construction itself. But that's part of our tenant improvement requirements. So yes, they do stay with the building. Yeah, I was thinking more about you know if, if somebody else comes in and then we'll have to rearrange the building, perhaps open that back up. But you're saying that that part of the building will have to stay, yes. regardless of who's in there. Correct. It's walls, restrooms, and the windows. improvements that we're paying for are to the base building and not to anything specific for your use. Uh, <clears throat> that's correct. If you're thinking it's like exhibits or something like that, no, I was just no, thinking about you know, I'd like to get the unamortized portion of these improvements back if mm -hmm. you guys left. Yep, they'll be there. Okay, that is correct. And also, we have a current lease for the facility with the city, but we renew it to start the 10 year process when we move in the door when the doors open up. So, we had to go to a public referendum in order to have uh, it go from a five year to a 10 year lease it was the first time that there was a structure over the water at this location and it, <clears throat> it passed by 80 percent of the voters to allow us to go to the 10-year lease. Thank you. And I, I, I kind of agree with Commissioner Welch. Maybe we could, we could look into that before we... Can you repeat that? Yeah, I know. I know. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's a strange morning sometimes when that happens. But, um, but maybe we could take a look at the, the whether they qualify for some of those TIF dollars uh, for the capital. Since this will be a base building improvement, mm -hmm. That will be there for, and that's why they continue to utilize the dollars that from the county. I think that would be a, at least a candidate for it. If we could look at that, but thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Um, my question, Madam Chair, is for the county attorney. Mr. Clark's comment that he just made about a structure over water brings me back to some of the issues that we had. Do you remember with that restaurant that was over? Are, do we have any issues with? 
environmentally with the water and the, <laughs> the pier is permitted uh, so any issues that there may have been have been resolved long ago through the permitting process oh, and it was an, right. there was an extensive review undertaken uh, mm -hmm. to, to permit this because it is quite a substantial structure there and right. keep in mind that the pier does have a very long history um, of being there with a structure over the I water. know but that just sure. comment just tickled that in my head that I wanted to clarify thank you I would like to introduce Marianne Renfro. She's the chair Good morning. of the Tampa Bay Good morning. Directors. Great. I'm Thank sure. you for your volunteer service. Mm -hmm. It's a labor of love. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Commissioner Justice. Just want to say, considering all the information that we have and, and that they'll be submitting a clarification letter and that will be a chance for the consultants and attorneys to hash everything out, I would move approval on moving forward with this project. Second. I do have a question, though, Mr. Peter. Peter and and love Tampa Bay Watch, big fan. Um, the total cost for construction is four million dollars, right? The of the building itself, yes. That's, and that that falls on you, not the city, right? All of it. Uh, Seven hundred and eleven thousand is our responsibility. Is your response? Oh, okay, yeah. okay. How much money have you raised today? Total uh, for the program about one point nine million dollars. Our goal is to raise two point five. Is that operation or construction? That includes both construction, exhibits, and operations operation. for the okay. first year. I'm confident you guys are going to raise it. I know you had an appropriation request for that. That didn't go through, did it? That's correct. It did okay. not. All right. Thank you. That's we appreciate, appreciate your help and support. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to take the opportunity to agree with Commissioner Eggers again. <laughs> 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 I, I, this is an $87 million project, the last um, number that I saw for the mm -hmm. pier. The paper. Um, investment from the county and the city. I think that might be the better way to go. I was out there touring a couple weeks ago. It looks great. Uh, it's going to be a big success. I still think there's a question, though, on the room nights, and I don't want us to move down a path based on a number that might not be correct. So I'm looking at page six in the Lambert report, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if we can pull that up or not. It's the uh, Tampa Bay Watch attachment. But the total overnight stays is 12,000. That's correct. But then they divide it by two for two per two persons per room. And that's what gives you the 6,000 room nights. So, so we went back and forth with that as well. But uh, as I understand your application, your criteria is 10,000 tourist room nights, which fits in with our 12,000 figure, which is annual room nights. So in this chart that shows total potential new annual room nights, the 6,000 number, I think that's what our staff is referencing. So, yeah, and it probably is true, and that's why we reference it in an original application. We want to come back and clarify that with the uh, county Okay, staff. I'm just not understanding how you get from 6,000 to 12,000. So 6,000 is annual overnight stay, stays, but the actual tourist room nights is 12,000. And I would agree that it can I'm be confusing uh, because of the way that it's written. you think we can reconcile that? Pardon me? You think we can reconcile that and you'll be I over do. our minimum yeah. of 10? Mm -hmm. okay. The critical component to the peer district development down there provides some great opportunities and variety for our tourists that visit the downtown waterfront. Do we have any staff that can speak to that calculation? I, I want to be clear on... Okay. We'll 6, clarify 000. that yeah. if, this, if you <clears throat> want this to move forward in the process. Or you want it clarified now? I'd like to know before I vote on huh? it. Michael? I don't know. No. Come to me. I, I see a lot of finger pointing. I, I, I don't think we <laughs> can. Well, okay. If, I don't know. Get that clarified moving forward. You know. Uh, and it Michael's still goes to the TDC. I think that's probably yeah. something that maybe the consultant, we can take another look at it. But I do agree with Commissioner Welch. It seemed on its face that it didn't meet those threshold requirements. Again, they're your guidelines. You can waive them. You can move this forward subject to satisfaction that we can reconcile those figures to come back with the, to the TDC and the BCC at that juncture. If we can't, then we'll let the BCC know as well. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Are you all, all okay with that? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And then also ask the question about possibly using um, the TIF tax increment financing monies from the city of St. Pete. The only thing I was going to say there is I would imagine that 
any of the tenants that are going to be occupying that building probably each had to do some tenant build outs on their own. So while this is a not for profit and may be a different scenario, and as Commissioner Eggers noted, it, this, it's going to stay there in the building. But I certainly don't want to open up the door that, you know, we'll be paying for other tenant improvements or, and or that this would cause the city of St. Pete to have problems with their other tenants where they would have to then put TIF monies towards that build out. That's the only caveat I kind of want to just state on the record. Okay. And as we're going through it for this application, we should also probably understand what we mean by room nights for all our applications. Correct. And we'll... We heard that. We'll, right. we'll get a clarification. Got clarity. We'll come to that issue. Thank you both for being Thank here. You. And um, do we have a motion to move this forward? We do, don't we? Yep. Do, you made the motion. Yes, and who gave the second? Don't remember. I'll second. Thank you. Did. I did. Yeah. Okay. okay. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Long. And this is approval with conditions. Okay, that passes unanimously. Um, excellent discussion. I appreciate each vantage point, and I think we are moving ahead in a positive way. Thank you. Um, agenda item 14. Item 14 is a resolution approving the submission of the age-friendly Pinellas Action Plan to the American Association of Retired Persons. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner um, Justice and second by Commissioner Welch. And thank you to um, Lourdes and Daisy and all of your staff for all the hard work on this. Um, we are very excited about this plan. Oops. Okay. Um, passes unanimously. Great. Um, you were presenting this at the city manager's meeting? Actually, just, Daisy did Daisy? present at the city manager's meeting, gave an excellent give us presentation. A quick and. Um, talk to them about how to work with them and offer yeah. the, her support if they choose to go down and uh, do this within their community. Good morning, Daisy Rodriguez, Director of Human Services. So I did meet also with the uh, at the Mayor's Council. I did a presentation last week on May 1st, um, as well as the City Manager's meeting uh, this past Friday, and both were um, accepted very uh, favorably. And as uh, Mr. Burton says, I did offer any assistance and I think you all know now that uh, the governor has announced that the state of Florida has entered the AARP network. So it was really timely to be able to speak with them. That's wonderful news. Thank you again. Thank you. We appreciate Thank it. You. Okay, agenda item 15. Excuse me real quick. I'm sorry. Uh, Daisy, I don't know if you're staying or not, but I just really wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for the work and putting together that first meeting of the Veteran Services Coalition. Um, got all the feedback from that. What a productive meeting, great meeting, and uh, really appreciate your leadership on that. And I'll talk more about that maybe later, but I, I didn't know if you were staying for the meeting, but I wanted to publicly say thank you for your, for your efforts. Okay, agenda item 15. Agenda item 15 is an amendment to um, a lease agreement with EJB Fairway uh, for office space. This is for the CVB. Um, we ask that this item be deferred to a future meeting um, based upon the commission's comments so we can renegotiate the lease terms and bring back to you. Move motion to defer. Second. A motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Welch um, to defer until another time. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in paying any more money though. <laughs> Here. <laughs> that, yeah, I'll take that a bit. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the idea obviously is to amend it to have a three year with one year renewals. Um, so we're not locked in. Okay. As noted by Commissioner Eggers during the work session, um, it was a um, pretty big chunk of change per square foot. Okay. And, and, and the location. There's, there and the location. the other opportunities. So. Right. Waiting for a couple others. Oh, there we go. Unanimous approval to defer. 
Uh, 16. Item 16 is a resolution and First Amendment to the lease agreement with Pinellas Opportunity Council for office space at the 501 First Avenue beating, uh, building in St. Petersburg. Move approval. approval. Okay, Commissioner Gerard is the mo motion maker and the second is Commissioner Welch. When you do it simultaneously, I have to decide. <laughs> Sorry. Go through the vice chair. Jinx. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As we used to say. Okay, unanimous approval. Uh, moving on to agenda item 17, County Administrator Ms. I have four items uh, this morning. Uh, first, I'd like to announce the advertisement of a TEFRA hearing to be conducted on May 21st on behalf of Pinellas Preparatory Academy. Uh, Pinellas County um, Educational Facilities Authority met on April 18th and recommends moving forward with the TEFRA hearing. The school's um, plans to use the funds from the proposed bond issue for primary purpose of financing improvements to their current facility and to refund the authority's outstanding revenue bonds. The next item, um, after <laughs> uh, it took a while, but we want to announce, and I had sent out an email to you, um, but publicly announced the hiring of Hank uh, Hoodie as the county's new sustainability and resiliency coordinator. He'll be begin on July the 1st. Um, I think it's real important because Hank has a real strong background in community resiliency planning, coastal resource management, and climate change adaptability. Most recently, he worked as a planning and policy manager for Smart Home America. Prior to that, he worked as, um, as a coastal management specialist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, serving the Gulf Coast states, including Florida. So he has a real strong background. Um, you can see his um, educational background and will be at a tremendous um, in enhancement to our team and our sustainability program. Barry, I hope that you will take the opportunity to send him the article that's on the front page today. I will certainly do that. <coughs> that's frightening. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sir, I, I certainly will. Uh, third, I wanted to announce that we've shortlisted the finalist uh, for the Saint, uh, Visit St. Pete Clearwater President and CEO role. Uh, the three finalists are Brent Durad. He's the current president and CEO of Visit Tucson. Uh, Tamara Pigott is the Lee County Visitors and Convention um, Bureau Executive Director. And our own Tim Ransberger, who is our current Chief Operating Officer at Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Those three are the finalists. Um, we, had a, we had a tremendous group of candidates, and, and it was difficult to even narrow it down there. But because this is such a public position and supports our tourism industry, we're going to host a, a, a meet and greet with the three finalists um, from 6.30 to 8 o'clock uh, p.m. on Wednesday, May the 15th at the Sheridan San Key Resort. At that time, similar to the process you used in my selection, people will be able to provide comment cards and, and their thoughts as we go forward in making this important selection. Um, and then finally, I wanted um, our department is teaming up with several local organizations to participate in the Cereal for Summer food drive. As many as 250,000 children um, in our area suffer from hunger and the problems, especially, uh, this is especially critical during the summer months when they do not have access to meals at school. So we've invited all county departments to participate in this drive through May the 17th and the donated food will be distributed to local food pantries by feeding Tampa Bay and off faith, um, faith food bank later this month. And those are my announcements. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I guess we all need to bring in cereal on the fifth <laughs> floor. <laughs> Challenge. Okay. Um, agenda item 18, County Attorney. Under agenda item number 18, I am recommending you approve staff's recommendation as set forth in the confidential memorandum. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Gerard. Moved. Okay, passes unanimously. County Attorney Miscellaneous? Uh, yes, under Miscellaneous, um, I did just want to take a few minutes and discuss with the board uh, the appellate case that we received, the opinion uh, that I did share with you all uh, last Friday um, in the case of Joyner versus Pinellas County. As I indicated to you all, this is a case that relates to the Crossbar and Elbar ranches that Pinellas County owns, but which are located within Pasco County. 
Uh, as you all know, those were properties that were acquired by the county uh, some time ago and, and amassed over the years to uh, for, for well field development. And there are, in fact, well fields located within the boundaries of those ranches today that are owned by Tampa Bay Water and our active well fields. Um, the county has retained ownership of the broader area there. Some of you I know, I think, were on the board when we had a vote to perhaps uh, divest ourselves of that ownership a few years ago, which we declined to do. Uh, so we do still own those properties. Um, many years ago, there was a report that came out from the Inspector General that suggested <coughs> the immunity from taxation <coughs> and questioned whether we should continue paying those taxes. Uh, we have long taken the position, and we think it is the legally correct position, uh, that the county is immune from taxation. We agreed with the Inspector General. We stopped paying the taxes, uh, the ad valorem taxes, on those properties in Pasco County. Um, as you can imagine, Pasco County, the uh, tax collector and property appraiser in particular, not the county itself. The county itself, to be clear, is not a party to this litigation. Um, the tax collector, I know I read articles in the paper, not, not he's, he's more of a minor party here, but really this is a property appraiser issue um, in regard to what's the value of the property. We say, for their purposes, zero, because we think we're immune. Um, so this is a case where we, the county was sued. Uh, by the property appraiser, at least initially. The county, Pinellas County, did win at the trial court level with the trial court finding that we are immune from taxation. Um, unfortunately, the appellate court disagreed. <coughs> However, I will note, as I did note in my original email to you, uh, this was a divided panel of judges that issued this opinion. It's a three-judge panel. We had a, a majority opinion that obviously ruled against us. One of those judges that was in the majority uh, felt the need to write their own concurring opinion, which gave a little bit different reasoning for why they reached the result, which is we're not immune from taxation uh, in Pasco County. And then we actually had a very strong dissent written by the third judge on this appellate panel, which is very much in keeping with our legal position in regard to the case. Um, we have taken a look at this case now, and uh, we are going to be moving forward with filing some motions uh, in follow-up to that opinion, which came out on, I believe it was May the 3rd. Uh, we have a couple weeks to do that. So what we are going to move forward and do is file some motions in the Second District Court of Appeal, where this opinion uh, was issued. Uh, we'll be looking to have a rehearing, which is something fairly common. We do think we have very good grounds uh, to move forward and ask for a rehearing. We will likely be asking for a rehearing in banc, which means we will be asking the entire court to hear this case, not just the three-judge panel. There are 16 judges at the second DCA. Okay. So that's one thing that we are going to be asking for. Again, we had a very strong dissenting opinion written, and we do think that it's a... Um, legally prudent course of action to take to just ask the entire court to hear it. We are hoping that we will have support from the judge that wrote the strong dissent to move it forward in that fashion. Um, we are also going to be following up and asking for, through a motion, that this issue be certified as a question of great importance to the Florida Supreme Court. If you look on the final page of the case, which I did share with you all, again, our dissenting judge, uh, Judge Black, said he would have certified this question to the Supreme Court as a matter of great importance in the state of Florida. So we know that we have at least one judge there that supports uh, moving this forward to the next level. So we are going to follow up on that as well. Uh, the final thing we're going to do in a motion, keeping in mind we have to submit everything we would like to ask for in a motion within the, the time frame given, which is 15 days, uh, we're going to be asking for clarification. Uh, we think that there's some language in here that we would like to see clarified in a manner uh, that we think, again, is a prudent legal position to take. Um, so those are, the, those are the motions that we're going to be moving forward with to the Second District Court of Appeal, and we'll be having uh, those, those motions filed within the appropriate time period, which is about two weeks. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, given that the county attorney has brought this matter up before us today, I am uh, curious about whether or not there might be any interest in revisiting the subject of crossbar Albar again. It's been several years since we've gotten a lot of information about the financials and where we are. And I think my memory serves me correctly that we now have new managers up there. And it'd be kind of nice to have a review, I think, of how the new manager is doing and whether or not 
goals and objectives are being met? <laughs> is it costing us money? Are we making money? What is the status? We haven't heard that kind of a report in several years, I think. Um, well, let's let Jill finish that up, and then we'll talk about that in just a second. Well, I thought she was finished. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Are that's, that's okay. really what I have to report to you all. I mean, certainly there will be more to report in the future. Uh, but for now, this is our, our suggested course of action and what we will be following through on. Okay. Um, you know, depending on what we find in response to these motions that we plan to file, we, we will certainly be having further discussion. And, um, okay, well, very good. Thank you for the report. Thank you for um, the hard work by your office in this regard, and uh, we uh, appreciate it. Um, Commissioner Long, I agree with you. I would like to have a report. I am not interested in revisiting selling these properties, but I'm happy to have a report. I think with all the stuff that just has been happening at Tampa Bay Water, I think we all realize the importance of having that property. Nothing is ever. Um, I agree. <laughs> so, I wasn't suggesting that we sell. Okay, well, I just, I just would like to have a status. I wanted to make sure because <laughs> I I agree with you. It's good to get a report because we it was kind of a it was a huge change to change the manager of the property, and so um, we will put that on the agenda. Commissioner Welch. Thank you for resisting the urge to say I told you so. <laughs> but what you mentioned about Tampa Bay Water and what's been happening there has changed my opinion. As you know, you and I were on different sides of the sale of that. But that does give me pause, and that was one of the reasons you voted against it, was the potential mm -hmm. for what might happen in the future. So thank you for your comment. Well, thank you, and um, I, I am not a I told you so kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well done. He is, so get him started. <laughs> I just like it when you come to my side of the... Uh, well, events, you know, kind of change your perspective. Life happens. Great. Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, moving on to um, sorry, agenda item. Is there anything else? County no. Turn? Okay, uh, agenda item 20. We are now sitting as the Emergency Medical Services Authority. Agenda item 20 is an Emergency Medical Services Advanced Life Support First Responder Growth Management Agreement, also known as Priority Dispatch, with four municipalities and one independent fire district. Um, this, these include the cities uh, of Clearwater, Largo, Lelman Special Fire Control District, Safety Harbor, and Seminole. These are a result of a cooperative effort by our data-driven focus group at the request of some of our larger cities. To remind you, this is an opt-in agreement, so it's offered as a, as a choice. They have chosen to opt-in. Um, and uh, so it's here before you for your approval and recommended. We do have four chiefs that are here, um, three chiefs that are here in support um, if you have any questions. And we also have Jim Fogarty, uh, our Director of Safety and Emergency Services here. Any questions? Commissioner Welch and then well, Commissioner Peters. <laughs> well, thanks uh, to the chiefs and the districts that are partnering on this. It's been a discussion for a long time. Are discussions ongoing with the other districts? Yes. In terms of priority dispatch and what's and the timetable? I'll ask Jim to come up and, and address that directly. Yes, good morning. Uh, morning. Jim Fogarty, uh, Director of Safety and Emergency Services. Uh, yes, the, uh, we have ongoing discussions, and I, I wanted to make sure we frame this correctly as more than just priority dispatch. It's termed growth management for a very definite reason. And I'll use as an example, uh, Daisy Rodriguez, Human Services Director, Lourdes and I met with the Fire Chief of Treasure Island just last week. They were dealing with a homeless issue down there in terms of its impact on their emergency services. They recognized in three months, one individual was responsible for 13% of their call volume, and so they needed a way to deal with that. So to answer your question, we are surgically working with each and every fire department to try to understand how to best manage the services, including priority dispatch. Um, we've worked with the city of uh, Clearwater, we've worked with the city of Seminole, and we're working with all of them. This is an effort to uh, allow folks that want to uh, partner with the, uh, the county in engaging priority dispatch, and but not forcing those that choose not to. Okay. Now, priority dispatch as an entity has been in service for years. If you're in a skilled nursing facility, uh, the skilled nursing priority dispatch card has been worked, uh, working for, for many, many years and sending only an ambulance when a nurse 
is by the patient's side in terms of uh, a car crash. If you crash your car and it's not likely that there's any patient care, only the fire department is sent because there's classes to clean up. So priority dispatch is a broad term. This uh, growth management proposal includes um, a change to two of the types of situations, uh, a fall and a sick person. And that represents the highest reason folks call and the second highest reason folks call. And Madam Chair, when is our review of the EMS fund as we roll into the budget? Is that coming up pretty soon? or I know we've got a BIS this Thursday, I think. Right. That, that'll be as part of the county budget process and review. That's correct. I, I don't have a particular date it, 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 as the, the county administrator um, okay. budget process. But has the growth in calls impacted the long-term forecast for the EMS fund? Oh, it has. And the growth in calls, um, we, we've actually taken some steps to moderate the growth in calls. Um, now, depending on the month you look at it, if you look at the month of March, the number of uh, individuals transported to the hospital was um, very high. As a matter of fact, it was the highest month on record. Two months before that, it was in a, on a downward trend. But overall, um, we expect the growth of calls to increase, and probably the hope is with the uh, increase in growth of population. In, in terms of some of the calls that are growing, um, the, the social service type call that you might think that the uh, community could deal with through some of the other social services channels become 911 calls as part of the safety net. Those are the types of calls we're trying to, to manage the growth with. Thank you. Commissioner Peters. Um, yeah, so the, one of my questions is, is this, um, where our firefighters, when they respond, they respond average four and a half minutes. So the average of this response, because it's fall and sick, is that an average of 15, 20 minutes? Well, you have to, let me answer the question, uh, the, this growth management plan for an individual that is um, an alpha, non-emergency. Right. Uh, the estimated time is about 10 minutes for the responder to get, to get there. Right now, two advanced life support units are sent to that location. Uh, this plan and this one alpha plan calls for only one of those advanced life support units. Both of the units as they're sent today are sent in a non-emergency status. Uh, this would remove one of the advanced life support uh, units and keep the second one on the call. On the sick and fall, they don't send fire? No, the sick and fall, they do send fire. Um, when you speak of a sick, uh, a, a, a sick person, um, it ranges from someone who's sick because they're about ready to have a cardiac arrest <coughs> to someone that's sick because they've got the sniffles and they haven't had a chance to see their uh, urgent clinic. And so that's the universe of a sick person. And so the priority dispatch program that we have is a questioning system that's designed to try to tease out the crisis case from the non-crisis case. For instance, the city of Tampa has been using priority dispatch <clears throat> and in the alpha response, they have a 60 minute response time that they send the private ambulance to. Hillsborough County, likewise. In Pinellas County, uh, the proposal is uh, to allow a non-emergency response ALS to continue, but not just, just not to send two units. Okay, so Hillsborough will be 60 minutes, but you're projecting Pennell, so it'll be 10 minutes? 10 minutes, but no longer than 20 minutes in terms of some cases. If the ambulance company uh, projects that uh, the unit would be longer than 20 minutes, the fire department is re-added to the call. Okay, okay. And I love that it's opt-in, um, which gives me less concern. But we've been down some paths before when cities opt into things, and it didn't go well. Right. Um, my concern is we had an example today of somebody who got recognized for their work who uh, was transporting on something that was very minor and then she went into seizures. And so my concern is that although we train people to vet these out in these calls, that we'll have somebody sitting at home waiting for the 20 minutes that may end up going into seizures because it didn't come out. Just like it didn't come out on that call that we just awarded that woman that today. So that's my only concern. Um, and so what I would ask is that you keep specific data on these cities that have decided to opt in to see how many times we may have missed on vetting that out in a call and how many times that we have to send the fire. And I know you keep great data. So if you can do that for me, that would make me feel a lot more comfortable because I, I am apprehensive only because I don't want one person to end up in cardiac arrest and maybe die because we decided to change something for the right reasons right. 
and then and then have something terrible happen. So if you could collect that data for me on these four cities yes. would be we, great. We will do that. I, th okay. That is part of the plan, absolutely. Thank you. Commissioner? I just wanted to thank everybody involved in the uh, focus group and the fire chiefs particularly involved for being willing to go forward with this, I think. The fire chiefs You know, we up. all know it's sort of taken a chance. It's a change from what we've done before, but, I, you know, I know that you'll be watching it very closely. And They're an amazing group of professionals to work with. I I they have their community's mm -hmm. best interests at heart. And if you permit me to tell a quick story uh, <laughs> yes, about please. why this happens, and I think it's an important story. I was presenting up to the East Lake Fire District when they were considering whether to use this plan, and I had to present, and some of you have heard this story before. Uh, I was sitting with my wife in a restaurant, Ford's restaurant on US 19, and across the street at Cody's, there was a Sunstar unit called an emergency. I have an application on my phone. It tells me what the emergency is. It was a choking. Now, I know Clearwater because I spent many years working with Clearwater. I said, well, I wonder where Engine 50 is. They're the closest. Engine 50 was on a lift assist. I said, well, interesting. I wonder where Engine 53 is, which is Safety Harbor Unit, which is the next closest unit. And Engine 53 was on a lift assist. Now, again, there's... It doesn't diminish the reason for Engine 53, but the next closest unit was Station 48 out of Clearwater, which serves top of the world. So I um, had to make it, you know, thank goodness that the Sunstar unit happened to be in the area that could respond. But this would have ideally kept at least one or two of the closer units available for that choking patient, as opposed to the lift assist that probably couldn't have the time specific. What's a lift assist? Lift assist is when someone is... Um, maybe out of the wheelchair and they need assistance getting back in bed. And so when, you know, when the party dispatch system works correctly, it doesn't oversend two advanced life support units to that type of an environment and would send only one, leaving the advanced life support unit available. And if you've seen US 19 at that time of day, six o'clock at night, to a car crash, a potential structure fire, all of those types of calls, when these units are on non-emergency calls, they're not available for the emergency. And that's the intention of this program. You know, there's unintended consequences. I that understand come with that. It, and that's my concern. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, thank you to the fire chiefs as well and for being here today. And with that, I'll entertain a motion. With approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Gerard. Okay, passes unanimously, and we are moving on to the companion item of agenda item 21. If this is the funding piece of item 20. Move approval. Second. Okay, motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Eggers. Okay, unanimous approval. Um, moving on to agenda item 22. Item number 22 are reappointments to the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Council. This is reappointing Karen Mullins in District 1, um, reappointing George Mar Marcado in District 7, and reappointment of Dr. Eric Carver as St. Petersburg College representative. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Welch. Okay, passes unanimously. Uh, moving on to County Administrator Report, hurricane season 2019. And I will note that one of the hurricanes is named Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to leave town if it decides to appear. <laughs> and with us today, we have Catherine Perkins, our Director of Emergency Management. She's been busy not only preparing for the hurricane, but putting me through uh, various drills and, and getting me up to speed with the activities and the preparatory uh, things that are, are in motion in preparation for our hurricane season. So she's going to provide an update. Great. Thank you so much. Good morning. Kathy Perkins, Director for Emergency Management. So this week is also National Hurricane Preparedness Week. And I just want you to know, as, as Mr. Burton mentioned, that we've been very busy over at Emergency Management helping to prepare with our partners. We've trained over 400 people in our Web EOC Incident Command System. We've trained over 125 people in our Damage Assessment System, and that includes our municipal partners as well. 
We've had 50 people through our desk officer training. 88% uh, of the disaster essential jobs that we have for the non-department um, non essential positions have been filled by county departments. So I want to thank all of our county departments and employees for stepping up to help us ensure that we're able to fulfill all of those job uh, requirements that we have during disasters. Uh, as Mr. Burton mentioned, we had the executive policy group meet yesterday. So we had the superintendent of schools. We had the sheriff's office. We had the county attorney there. And we walked through the process of if we had to declare that evacuation order, what would it look like? How would we convene the board to be able to declare that state of local emergency? Um, and we are also um, engaging in many activities this week to ensure that we are prepared. We're doing a communications check today. Um, we'll be bringing in all of our partners for a full activation of the EOC Wednesday and Thursday afternoon um, to walk them through the process of if we had to have a hurricane. And this is a time of year that many people want to ask me, how is the season going to be? Um, and the prediction is for an average season. But I, what I really want to impart upon everybody in the county is the only one that matters is the one that impacts your community. So whether it's the first one out of the gate in late August, known as Hurricane Andrew for uh, Miami-Dade, or it's the 13th one out of the gate known as Hurricane Michael that impacted our, our neighbors up in, in Bay County and, and the northern counties this past year. It doesn't matter how many there are. What matters is if it impacts your community. So with that, we want to ensure that all of our partners are ready. And the key messages that we have, there's four key messages that we have for our community, and this applies to all of you and all of our county employees. We want to make sure that everybody knows their risk. We want to ensure that everybody knows if they are in that storm surge area and they may have to evacuate. We want to ensure that people know if they are at risk for the winds. So our electric dependent folks and the folks that live in our mobile home uh, communities. Uh, we embarked on a, a project with our amazing fire districts um, distributing uh, bilingual door hangers to all 290 of our mobile home parks and we've completed 50 percent of that already and just from the door hangers that have gone on we've actually had requests for two outreach presentations to them and we had five people identify that they have special needs and they've signed up for our program so just alone i already consider that a success because we're already reaching uh, those populations and we want to make sure that people understand that they are at risk for flooding. So not just a storm surge, but if we were to have a storm that dumped a lot of rain on top of us, what would those low-lying flood-prone areas look like? And what can they do to be able to protect themselves? The second component that we want to make sure that everybody does is to make a plan. We want to make sure that once you've determined whether or not you have to evacuate, you know where you're going to go. So can you go to a host home? Can you go to a friend's house? Or maybe you have plans to go out of county. Um, we want to make sure that people know how to get to the materials that we have, that we have online. Um, the hard copy materials that we're printing, we're doing 100,000 of our English brochures. We have done a complete translation of our full brochure into Spanish for this year, so we'll be printing 20,000 of those, and we're increasing the number of the Vietnamese guides that we have to 6,000 to make sure that we're reaching, especially those more vulnerable populations where languages may be a barrier. We're also working very closely with marketing and communications to try to develop more of our materials in additional languages to try to help break down those barriers and get that information out. We also want to make sure that people are aware of where they can go, so the evacuation centers that are available to them, and whether there are people that have special needs that need that additional transportation assistance, whether they need to come into our public shelters our pet-friendly shelters, making sure they know how to take care of their pets and where they can go if they do have to evacuate with them, and really impressing on people that if you are going to evacuate out of county, you need to do that early. Otherwise, we're really impressing that people evacuate tens of miles, not hundreds of miles, and seek safety here locally. We want to make sure that people stay informed. So one of the amazing products that we do offer here for Pinellas County is Alert Pinellas. We will actually send information to your phones via text and to your emails. Um, and you can also identify different locations. So if you want to put areas at risk for children or your workplace or your home locations, uh, just over the weekend we had that tornado outburst, that severe thunderstorm. Um, so that information went out to the people that were in those impacted areas. It's really important, especially for uh, the tornado warnings because we get such little time for us to be able to seek safety. Uh, so yesterday we actually conducted an all call to try to clear up the database that we have for Alert Pinellas 
to ensure that we have the most recent numbers. And we continue to embark on campaigns to try to get more people to sign up for that valuable service. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, um, you know, when you call and it says uh, push one to know that you received it, um, what I found is this last weekend is I hit the one and I on the email, on the text message I hit the one and yet every five minutes I was still getting a call. I seemed to get a lot of calls even though I hit the one that I received it. Now I get the tornado one. That was different. Um, and that was great because you got my attention. Good. But um, <laughs> But on the other ones, when you tell us that there's a storm coming, when we hit one, you seem to call back like five, the county calls back like five or ten minutes later. And it seems to be consistently coming back. And I think once we hit that one that we received it, that maybe we don't have to call back again three or five minutes later and then three or five minutes later again. I'll so, clarify that with I, our technology person. Yeah, this weekend seemed to be worse than some of the others, but this weekend I got lots of calls. And it may be because they had put out a couple of different warnings and that may be why you're getting repeated calls, but okay. I would think if, I it's one, if it's one that we're sending out once you hit one, that that should stop because you're confirming that you received it. Right. I'll verify that for you. Yeah, because this last weekend that didn't work very well. Okay. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, and this, the fear with that is is then people may see that as an annoyance and then they'll ask to be removed yeah, from the list, yeah. and we don't want to that do was, that. That was kind of my concern because I was yes. going there. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> but it's really a great service, and <laughs> thank uh, so thank you. We want to make sure that people are preparing their homes. So on an individual basis, every single one of us is an emergency manager of our own household. We need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves, and if we're head of household, that we're taking care of all of those people that rely upon us. And then once we've taken care of ourselves, then we need to start reaching out and helping our family, our friends. As, as county um, stewards, we need to make sure that our employees are taken care of, and we want to make sure that we're reaching out to as many folks as possible. Uh, we want to try to get as many people to help us volunteer and assist in this process as available. So whether they're doing that through the volunteers and Pinellas program or perhaps as one of our ham radio operators, uh, we encourage that level of involvement and engagement. And I know through the Pinellas um, Citizens University, we've actually been able to engage a couple of people uh, just from that alone to be able to come in and be volunteers. So kudos to that opportunity for us to be able to do that. Um, we are looking at ensuring that we're trying to get more host homes. So we know that when we get to those Category 5 hurricanes, we have limited geography in terms of where people can go. So we need to try to find every location that we can. So we encourage all of our employees and, and all of our citizens to open up their homes for people that may have to evacuate. <coughs> we're um, working with churches, and we're going to start reaching out to especially some of our larger employers and businesses to see if maybe they have sites where maybe they can host uh, their their clergy or maybe their, their employees themselves to help make them safe. And we really want to make sure that everybody becomes a disaster partner. Um, this is not emergency management that does this alone. This is an all hands on deck. Everybody get involved when a disaster is coming. So again, just to reiterate, we want to make sure everybody knows their risk, that they make a plan, they stay informed, and then get involved. And all of that information and, and more preparedness information can be found at our website at pinellascounty.org slash emergency. And finally, I just want to tell you about an exciting event that we have coming up on Sunday, June 2nd. And I hope that some of you will be able to come out and join us. From 11 to 3, we'll be out at the Leelman Exchange. And we're doing our media and community day. So we're expanding the event from where previously we just had the media come in and we could um, give them sound bites and talk to them about what we're doing. We're actually going to invite the community in. We're going to have the touch a truck and we invited in more of our community partners, Salvation Army. We've invited in Red Cross, Duke Energy. Um, we've got PSTA coming out. Uh, we want to take advantage of this day to actually make some videos, talk about if you had to go to a shelter, show them what a go kit would look like. If you're going to stay at home, what would your stay kit look like? If you have to get on a bus with your animal, how do we do that? So we put them in the proper cage or we have them on the leash. And again, we're going to take all of these little videos that we're creating. We're going to translate them into Spanish and Vietnamese and then make those accessible um, to the community. So thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work with you, hopefully as exercises only. Okay. <laughs> um, on the list of supplies, um, when Michael hit, I somehow I had intuition and did a drive. I, I promoted it long before the storm hit. So we were very successful, and we were the first ones up to bring supplies. And one of the things they contacted me for before we sent the planes and the trucks was gas cans.
Oh. They had no gas cans to fill the, the chainsaws or to fill the generators. And so can we add gas cans onto our list? Because when they called me and said, please, whatever you can, send us gas cans. We have no gas cans. Nobody thought of that. It's not on the list. And it's one of those, well, of course it should be on the list. So um, uh, that was a big one up there. I mean, they have a lot more trees than a lot of us do, but um, it was a big deal. So if we could add that to the list, okay. I think it would be helpful. Great. I don't know that we can get it into the guides that are already being printed, uh, but, but definitely on our online materials, and we can also mention yeah. that in our video. Thank you. It's something you. none of us thought about, and, and they were desperate for gas cans. I was able to get a bunch up there, but it was just something nobody thought about. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. You've been hard at work along with your staff. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Um, we are now at Citizens to be Heard. Um, and on FIXA is the topic, and it's Lawrence Rose. Good morning. Uh, it's actually about uh, Palm Harbor Community Service Agency, PHCSA. Does, do they report to you? They actually have their own board of directors. Who oversees them? FIXA board. Oh, the FIXA, FIXA board. board oversees. FIXA? FIXA, Palm Harbor. Yeah, it's, a gr it ma it's made up of recreation and library services. And there's a board that oversees those four entities. And the one you speak of is one of those four. Okay, but and they meet once a month. Do they report to you at all? They get budget approval from us. But what about if there's an issue with discrimination? Because I've gone before a different director there, and uh, she has not responded. Have you gone before that board yet? I have not. They have an attorney on that board as well. I know it's Andrew Salzman. Yeah. So I have an issue with him. So uh, well, they're have, discriminating you, against senior citizens. They're keeping that park closed for seniors. I don't know of any park in North County that keeps it closed for seniors. Well, you're they looking may, at somebody who's been discriminated against, and I'd like to be able to, you know, talk to somebody. If I go to FIXA, it's a, an agenda with those people from that board. They don't oversee any park. But I've actually contacted your office as yeah, well. Yeah, and my office has responded um, so uh, several times. And Not really. Keep, keep, keep in mind now that uh, you have eight folks on that board that represent you so, so to have not gone to that board give them a chance to respond to your concerns because you're talking about one director and one you're talking director. about an attorney right. but there's eight board members that oversee all of those people all right. i mean i'm just saying in fairness you don't say that fixa hasn't responded to you they're the they are the governing board of those facilities and assets up there would you have a contact number uh, will they meet um we can get the uh, the schedule so that you can meet. They come. They have a board meeting every month, so you All can right, go there. They have like opportunities to... to speak at the meeting, before the meeting, or after the meeting to any of the board members. I would like to be able to gain access to that meeting. Yeah, yeah. And you can contact my office, and we'll let you know when the next meeting is. It's usually the third Wednesday of the month. And. <clears throat> I'll verify your email, but we will email you the information. And okay. Commissioner Eggers is correct. Um, you really should go to the FIXA board. If I don't have uh, any kind of resolve with that board. And we have the Office of Human Rights and Paul Valenti. I will also send that information to you as well. All right. Um, that is the countywide agency that oversees all, you know, housing, et cetera, discrimination. Okay. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David Ballard Geddes. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Uh, if no one else is paying attention, we are living in a cesspool. Our government, we are spraying sewage everywhere, and the situation stinks. If it smells like a political duping of society, wake up. I've spent 10 years introspecting, shining light on, finding fault in, and getting a good sense of this issue beyond a reasonable doubt. Our government is using our number two as a Second Amendment right. 
Don't kid your thoughtlessness. Our government is doubling down on their constitutionally flushing us down the drain. According to the Reclaim Water variants, us, the people, are being mandated to literally forfeit our health, our safety, religion, liberty, property, and life in the 14th Amendment as we, the people, take everything us, the people, ever thought we ever had. Today's overdevelopment is being placed on outdated in and inadequately funded infrastructure. Deliberately, the water is being delivered to the civilian population uh, in uh, uh, outdated water pipes, and they don't test for the element mercury on our consumer confidence report. Our government constitutionally is a false front fortnight operation. Inhaling, breathing lawn irrigation is soon to infect us all. Our government has lied to us constitutionally beyond a reasonable doubt. Water is being promulgated as a Second Amendment right, legislatively imposed against the civilian population. Contaminating the water supply is a legislative objective, and the 14th Amendment is the firing pin to that Second Amendment gun, using water as its powers among the earth. We need to lay down some infrastructure. I've been in front of this board for 10 years, and we still have water pipes in St. Petersburg that are in excess of 80 years old. Um, and that would, and, and it's clear across the board with every other city and municipal government in the county. Let's get down the infrastructure, and let's go to court on the 14th Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, County Commissioners. Greg Pound, Largo, Florida. I want to speak on the issue of families and what's going on with our families in Florida and in this country. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. We're not to sell the truth. And once we see a, a system, a predatory system, that goal is to destroy the family. Now, this started with Planned Parenthood with a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger, who was the founder of Planned Parenthood. And you can read her writings through, through Wikipedia and how she wrote about how to destroy the African-American family of America. And because at one time in this country, the strongest family unit was the African-American family. And they came in, and the way they destroyed it was getting the women outside the home, um, dividing up the family, separating the children from their fathers, the state coming in and subsidizing the mother to get, out, get away from the father and all this other stuff. This is what now has undermined the structure of our society and the, and the strength of our society is our families. Now, you look at Europe, Canada, other countries, the exact same thing. Islam is coming in in massive groves into this country with the goal to go ahead and... I mean, and what, what we're doing, by what we're doing in our, in our court system, the predatory system in our family court, because once you destroy the family, you got the father, the mother, the children stuck in the court system. You're producing, you're breeding Islam because it's a religion where the men can rule like tyrants and the women have no recourse. You look at, um, you look at Elijah Muhammad for the black Muslim faith in America where he impregnated all his secretaries and as, Markham, as Malcolm X went ahead and tried to expose it, they killed him. So, so this is the this is what you this is what you're going to replace Christianity with in America, because of your because now we got more women working than men, more women graduating from, from college than men. We got more women attorneys now than men. The men are being you're, 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 you've, instead of siding with the men, we got a court system that's a predatory system, and they're attacking the male. And this is what we've got now in our society. And you can see the broken society. Go look at all our young people without fathers. They've got mothers, but go look at them. I mean, we're, I mean, I deal with them every day. What you're doing with them out in the Pinellas County court system, all you're doing is building bigger prisons to put the men in, in every state. You've got more prisons in Florida than you do counties. You're destroying the family because that's the number one biggest dollar in the court system is family court. Once you destroy that family, you're undermining yourself. And you think you're going to get away with it? You think Europe's going to get away with it? You, you need to find out what's going on in these other countries because it's, it's right here in America. It's just ready to pop, and you're going to be, the, you're going to be on, the, on the cutting edge of it. Thank you very much.
That's all the citizens to be heard. Uh, moving on to agenda item 25. Agenda item 25 is an appointment to the Pinellas County Construction Licensing Board. Uh, this is approving Evelyn Spencer as our county building official to the board. Second. Motion by um, Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. There we go, unanimous approval. Um, so agenda item 26 is County Commission new business items, the MSTU funding proposal, Commissioner Gerard. This is for uh, Seminole Junior Warhawks fields uh, for um, repairs to the chain link fence and software for the lighting prediction uh, system. Um, a total of $17,495. Move approval. Second. Um, motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Welch. And you have a question? Yeah, I just would like that running total whenever we have this, mm. these kind of requests. We know what's left in the, mm -hmm. in the balance. Those available if you cancel that if you want. So we'll add that to future agendas. Okay. Um, the voting ballot, I just want to clarify, it's just approving the MSTU funding proposal only. It has other things on there, too. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. Bill Burton morning. with the Budget Office. Uh, the sheet that's uh, on the overlay right now will show you what the running balance is. Uh, that's a summary report. We have the detailed report that you've seen before also that we'll distribute after the meeting. Okay. Um, but prior to the request that you are in the process of considering, there was $356,000 available. Prior to this one? Prior to this okay. one, correct. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bill. Okay, next is the appointment to the Youth Advisory Committee, and Commissioner Peters has kindly agreed to um, be in charge of the Youth Advisory Committee effective June 1st, 2019. I do want to take the opportunity to thank um, Commissioner Gerard. Um, you've done an excellent job, and I think you've helped to um, train future leaders, which you should be very proud of all that you've accomplished, and we sincerely thank you. They're a lot of fun. Well done. Did I have a motion from Commissioner Welch? Yes, ma'am. Second. Okay. Who's the second? <laughs> I'm Commissioner Gerard. <laughs> I'll take the voting cards on that one. Thanks, Commissioner Peters. He doesn't look. <laughs> Don't I have absolute oh, whoops. Thank you, Commissioner Peters. Do whatever I want. Thank you. <laughs> My print agenda is slightly different. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have an old one. <laughs> yeah. Pinellas County Legislative Day, Joint Tampa Bay Legislative Day, Commissioner Long, and I believe um, the county attorney has some information as well. Oh. So, can I? Yeah. Keep in mind that my only request from our workshop was that we get a consensus that this would be a good idea to move forward with to gain more information and gather all the facts before we take an official anything. And I recognized when I introduced it that there were a lot of missing pieces, and I think it bears further discussion. But contrary to some of the concerns that I've heard about, I did not ask for an official yes or no. Just want to be able to talk about it and explore all of the possibilities. That said, I would like to uh, also remind you that there is in the legislature strength in numbers and that Broward and Dade counties have been doing this for as long as I've been involved in the legislature and clearly over the last several decades they have brought gobs of money back to their communities and so I think especially given that we have strong leadership coming from this region we would be foolish not to pursue this. Okay. 
Well, so. we'll continue Thank to you. do the research on it and come back with you with a proposal. Great idea, but for the folks who didn't see that meeting because it's not televised, can you just talk a little bit about what? Well, yes, the idea was that we would go forward with an interlocal, I don't know if it's a resolution or a memorandum of understanding, I don't know what that looks like, that would include Pinellas County, Hillsborough County, and Pasco County to have a joint visit with the legislature next session. That little summary does not exclude the local chambers and the school boards and you know other folks who really need and look forward to assistance from the state to be able to come along and be part of the adventure it is not necessarily a lobbying effort or an effort to um, influence us as much as it is an opportunity to show strength and unity on those regional big issues that we all work so hard on with our legislative folks. And you know, we spend a lot of time focused on our delegation, but clearly it's not just our members that sit on, I'm just gonna bring up transportation for lack of a better example, it's not just the Pinellas County members that sit on the transportation TED committees that funnel the money. And so I think it's important to have a large, loud, very focused message from our region. And because we worked in concert with those other uh, counties, we were very successful this year for the first time ever, thank you Florida Legislature, in receiving a very nice appropriation for T. Barta. Well done. So, thank you. That's my summary, best as I could sum it up. Great. Okay, thank you very much and um, we'll be back with you um, as we come forward with some kind of program. Mm -hmm. That will do. Okay, next on the agenda is the um, PSTA requested that I um, send a letter of support for the um, low or no emission vehicle deployment program um, grant request. And I just wanted to make sure that you all were fine with that before I sent it. Did you want a motion or? Yes, I would. Uh, move approval. Second. Um, motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Peters. Just uh, real quick, that's we're, we're just uh, agreeing that we should send this grant request in, which is a matching Correct. One, $1 for $1 uh, on purchase of buses, so that the otherwise $900,000 bus, we're going to get two for that right? instead of just one. So, okay, thank you. And um, I... Okay, that's unanimous. Okay, the next is, um, I'm gonna frame this in a little bit different way. So, these are Salvador Dali oh, sure. pups. Are you bribing us? Yeah, she is. Okay. <laughs> so I was up in Philadelphia area this weekend for my husband's 50th um, college reunion and the hotel that we were staying at featured these. Thank you. And I thought they were um, really quite interesting. So they used somehow the drawings of Dali to create a edible piece. So um, what I'm bringing forward to you today is simply information. Um, we have been working on this Culinary Institute idea for almost, I would say, a year now, have visited various other culinary schools in both Orlando as well as here. Um, we are looking at the Florida Gulf Coast Art Museum site. Um, and also, and I have mentioned this at previous um, work sessions, but we're coming on the Tourist Development Council budget on May the 15th. And so I wanted to at least take this proposal forward to them to have them consider funding a feasibility study. To me, as you know, I don't like to fly by the seat of my pants 
on anything. I like to have data and I like to have information before any decision is made um, in moving forward with such a program. To me, we have quite a bit of information, but to me, the next logical step is to look at um, doing further research and having someone who is highly qualified to do that research to put the numbers and the facts behind any decision that would be then brought to the TDC and to the Board of County Commissioner for future um, decision making. So I just didn't want you all to be surprised that I was going to take this to the Tourist Development Council and ask them to consider this. Um, in the background information, I also mentioned that we want to look at, um, obviously Heritage Village has archives in the actual museum. Um, the Botanical Gardens stores their holiday lights within the museum. You know, Creative Pinellas is currently there and would like to continue to stay. And also an important component of this is that the gallery space, et cetera, would still be an art museum um, present there. So it's looking at combining and looking at kind of all these facets that I just wanted to make sure, again, that there was facts and data behind it. And um, so that's why I was just bringing you everything that I had to date pretty much for just your information purposes. Commissioner Gerard. Well, I, so I had a conversation not too long ago with a former parks employee who had, I think, 30 years working in the parks uh, and was now on our parks board and gave me a long history of how often we've had people come and ask to do non-county related things in our parks. And I wasn't aware of half of them, but I know that we've turned down a number since I've been here. Uh, I just think that we have entities right there in this little map right here who need space, including the Botanical Gardens and Heritage Village and probably Creative Pinellas could use more and the Parks Department could probably use more. I'm not sure why we're even entertaining. I know it sounds like a great idea, but I'm not sure why we're entertaining a private entity to come in and do this or if it's, in, if it's part of SPC that's just as bad. I mean, this is our, this is our complex. And I, I just have a problem with that. I'd rather see us spend the money that you're talking about doing a feasibility on study, a space study on the needs of the entities that are already there. You know, it, it, and when I look at this little map, I just don't see a school going in the middle of our botanical gardens. I, and I'm not sure who we is that's been working on it, but it hasn't been me. It, no, it's been, been me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, we you mean. know, we haven't had the opportunity to talk about this, mm -hmm. and I don't want it going to the TDC before. Well, let's hear from the rest of you, but I have a real problem with doing something like this in our park. I guess how I want to respond to that is, um, I've been trying to show this facility for some time to anybody because it, we don't have the visitation to the botanical gardens. We don't have the visitation to Heritage Village. There's no visibility. Huh? There's no visibility there. Well, I, don't, I mean, the botanical gardens is hidden way in the back behind the cooperative extension, behind Creative Pinellas. It's like, how Nobody do you expect people to even know? I had to go over there and visit them. <laughs> And I couldn't even find the office. They have one 10 by 10 foot square office and, and some storage space that they pay for. It's like we treat them like dirt, frankly. And you know, you'll see in my decision packets that I asked for some little bit of support from them for them. But I, you know, yeah, I think we would have a whole lot more if we were putting anything into the botanical gardens, we'd have a whole lot more visitors, but we're not. Mm -hmm. Other than, you know, the parks department comes in and does whatever. I don't know what they do. Mow some grass once in a while. Otherwise, it's all volunteers, all paid for by the foundation. 
which, you know, does not help them grow or look like a real botanical gardens. One of the other things that I've talked about with Barry, um, in the next penny there is 2.4 million that is allocated for um, a visitor center that actually in the last penny had $10 million allocated. And that never happened because of the recession, so that was pulled out. And so vision with me as you drive along Almerton Road, it is a visibility problem. Right. So I had talked to Barry whether we could also, we could either wrap it in here or we could do it separately, whether we should try to look at pushing out and redoing that whole entranceway so that it was right on Almerton Road and so it would have the visibility for the whole site and what that would mean and what that would be, I'm not sure, but I do think that would help tremendously with maybe redoing that whole problem that we have with the visibility. So that's kind of a separate item, but that's something that I've been thinking Ooh, about um, as I walked all the grounds of the, um, of the grounds. So, um, so I do hear what you're saying, and I was trying to see if, again, to me, one of the problems has been getting lack of foot traffic and people there on a daily basis, and um, and yet the so parking lot is full. Trying to all the time. trying to have um, people there on a daily basis would draw other people, and and that was kind of the one of the ideas, Commissioner Long. Yes, thank you for bringing this idea forward, Commissioner Seal. I know how hard you've been working on it for so long, and. Um, and I, like Commissioner Gerard, was when I heard you repeatedly use the word we, I couldn't quite figure out who you were referencing because since I've been on the County I'm Commission, sorry. we've had several conversations about the Gulf Coast Museum with folks that have been interested in going in there. I mean, <laughs> one of the ones that comes to my mind is because it was amusing to me for some reason. Remember the guy that wanted to do a, um, a clown thing or a circusy type thing in there? And, you know, we've just had, had a lot of interesting, there was a, another gentleman that wanted to do a, something had to do with fish. We had a fish. fish and we had a contract for... with him for a while. My, my uh, hesitancy to move forward to, that I would encourage you to not take it to the TDC at this moment is because I don't think we have enough information and this is really the first time that you're articulating your vision to the rest of us so that we can think about it, number one. And number two, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think so. I remember in the very early days when Carl Cutler, the former president of St. Petersburg College, was envisioning a campus on that property where the Seminole campus is today. And I happened to have been on the city council at the time, and we orchestrated a joint agreement between the college and the city to build that beautiful library there, right? It is just thriving as we speak. That said, when we went from that to building the recreation center, the, the, the city and the college put a lot of work into building a real commercial kitchen inside that rec center because the idea that Carl had was that we would, he would develop a curriculum on that campus strictly for hospitality and training chefs and cooking and doing all of that kind of thing. And don't we also have the same kind of curriculum at P-TECH? I know we all go out there once a year and it's all the students that are preparing the food. So while I think it's a very novel idea, I guess I'm struggling with how it belongs on a county site when it's, to me, educational and academia should be more embracing it. I don't know if that makes any sense, but those are just my initial thoughts. Um, I think I put in the background information, but there, if you haven't been to Armature Works in Tampa, I have it's a food there. hall. So the concept of this would be um, similar to what a culinary institute is doing in different places where they literally, you know, have the students 
serve, sell, and staff and do an entire food hall. Um, and I understand where you're coming from. I was actually approached years ago by Jim Oliver about putting the um, culinary program at this location. And at the time, I resisted thinking, you know, why would we want to do this? But quite frankly, you know, we've been out to RFP um, more than a couple times trying to find people who would be able to use this facility and or, you know, do something um, bold and good with it. And the, the Gulf Coast Fishing Museum failed, the Florida Gulf Coast Art Museum failed. And so, again, I've been trying to find interest in this, and this finally seemed like something that could be... Um, could be great for the campus. So are you thinking that it would mirror what is con currently at the Armature Works? It would be something, kind of I mean, that's why a feasibility study is needed because I need to, I would need fact-based ideas, I mean, something that would back up this idea that it is feasible and that it is inclusive of Heritage Village and that it is inclusive of the Botanical Gardens. And so it was meant to be um, a study so that we know how to um, proceed with this. So are you or thinking not. that it would be a total of $5 million to do the study? Pardon me? No, no. no. Well, it, says, it says need to match $2.5 million in kind plus $2.5 million in cash. No, we don't. Let me explain that. Yeah, please. That was just to give you some information, but I, I think that the feasibility study um, would cost up to $100,000. The, um, there was a sitting in Creative Pinellas' bank account and a separate bank account is a $2.5 million grant from the Jacobson Foundation to do this Culinary Institute. I know I've mentioned this earlier to you all before. This was done very early with some preliminary information by Frank Chavez. Um, he was able to secure this. Um, part of the grants, um, it has really very few strings on it other than $2.5 million in in-kind and $2.5 million in matching funds. I have not identified any of that. That is not, I don't anticipate asking the general fund for cash for the $2.5. Um, so this is just, I was just trying to give you as much information as I have at the present time in this, and I'm sorry it's mischaracterized and makes you worry that I'm going to be coming and asking you for $2.5 in cash. <laughs> do we have any idea what it will be? Huh? Do, do you have any idea at this point what the ask will be? No, and that's why you need a feasibility <coughs> study, because I have no data, no budget, no anything to to have any tangible information. So that's why I felt like if there was interest in pursuing this, that this would be the next step, is, is to get fact-based information. And they may come back and say, this is not a good idea. And um, I have visited all the local institutions that do food service, um, culinary schools, um, this would be actually, we even talked to um, USF St. Pete because we thought this could end up being almost a feeder into their hospitality program. What I'm trying to do is sort of like Dr. Tanja Williams has mentioned to us, you know, let's start here and let's end here and let's have some kind of continuum of programs. Um, it's just that, you know, as you know, we have a burgeoning restaurant industry and a lot of local restaurants that are opening every day within Pinellas County. And we have heard over and over again that there is a need for a A to Z hospitality program that includes also um, mechanical skills programs for people who would fix restaurant equipment. So this would almost be everything. It would be like a acting operating art gallery and as incubator. well as a restaurant or restaurants or it might even be somewhere to the hall on franklin which is an incubator for restaurants so they might come in i don't know <laughs> that's why i need skilled consultant to give us information what's the feasibility study for i'm sorry what was the feasibility for 
What's the, the study feasibility for? is to study whether this idea even has merit. What I, the idea on our property or just in general? No, the, it would be for that property because you'd have to see how you would program it. Again, taking in the needs of the Botanical Gardens and Heritage Village. What would be the operating costs? What would be a budget? You know, who could be potential partners in the Culinary Institute? Um, you know, what is the market for it? You know, everything that you would look at in an intelligent way to make a decision. But to, to Commissioner Gerard's comment, would it be the feasibility, would, it, would that include the needs of our existing <coughs> folks that are in the park? Correct. And whether that's a good, maybe that's, maybe the idea is good, but the, the fit is not good. Maybe that okay. fit's not good, but we, we identify additional needs there. I mean, is it kind of broad-based enough that it would be helpful regardless of whether this use we can, I certainly was including Heritage Village as well as the Botanical Gardens in that whole, you know, look-see as we already have the Botanical Gardens um, master plan that they've given to us. So that would be given to the consultant and, you know, Heritage Village, whatever information they have. I, they do not have a, they have an old master plan that's quite old. Um, but they, again, it was identified that they needed archive and um, and a visitor center. I don't know whether that, again, is <coughs> in the next penny. And my other idea, like I said, of pushing out to Omerton Road and creating an entrance there, that might be a different study. I don't think you could incorporate all of that into this. That's more of site plan and, you know, and that kind of thing. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am uh, excited that you have done this work. I agree with my colleagues. We need to have more discussion about it so we have consensus on where we're going. But Commissioner Long mentioned uh, St. Pete College, and I recall that I was on the St. Pete College trustee board when the concept of the epicenter was talked about. And I was on that side of the vote when the college decided to move forward with the epicenter. I see this as having that kind of potential. That there are two things, two areas that are stuck in my mind as being underutilized, and I think we're addressing both of them. One is Toy Town. We've been trying to figure out what to do there for so long, and now this, this amateur sports idea. Um, and I think we're moving forward with studying that. Or, mm -hmm. And to me, I view this the same way. Th that Heritage Village has been such an underutilized asset. Folks get out there for the holiday lights. That's not a problem. But the I rest know, of the it's year, so gorgeous. you know, I remember we had the African American Heritage Festival, and it's just tough to get folks to come out there. It's not right on the on the main drag, and folks, it's been an issue trying to get a main draw out there. So I'd be really interested in seeing what this feasibility study shows. And I'm big on culinary, obviously. No comment, Justice. <laughs> But my daughter uh, was in culinary at Northeast, and that really introduced me to the potential um, for culinary as a, as a career for our kids. And, and the Northeast culinary, and I think there's one in North County as well, um, that is a real career track for a lot of our kids. So I just see a lot of potential there. I would like to have more discussion about it, but to me, a feasibility study would be the next logical step. I agree we need to have consensus on that as a board, but I, I think this makes a lot of sense in seeing if we can make this truly a viable uh, asset for the county because it has not been since I've been here. We can't get folks out there consistently, and this might be a draw, but we do need to look at all the other things, that the needs of the other departments that are out there. But I'd like to see a feasibility study. Well, um, certainly, you know, I was trying to do this in logical steps because I – you know, obviously I wanted to take this to the Tourist Development Council to consider as far as their budget process, as I mentioned on May the 15th, but I didn't want you all to be surprised that I was asking to look at this. And then um, obviously, depending on what they say, then it would come back to us during our regular budget process. So it's not, this is merely step one of many steps that it would come back to you for um, your approval to be put in the budget or not put in the budget. So by that time, I would promise you I might have a much better fleshed out <laughs> <laughs> request for proposal idea so that you could take a look at it. Um, I'm just asking that you at least allow me to take it to the Tourist Development Council for um, 
for their consideration. Thank you. Um, I mean, Justin. I mean, St. Pete College has a, a AS program for hospitality and tourism management. USF St. Pete doesn't have anything yet. Maybe they Looking will someday. At an advanced degree. Yeah. Um, but I, I think, well, I think this is a good practice for this new process of having the feasibility study for non-traditional CVB funding. So I think us working through the kinks on that is not a bad thing to do. Period. Um, but I think if we do a feasible feasibility study, it shouldn't just be for that facility, mm -hmm. but for the overall need for the culinary arts program that you're kind of talking about. Um, because if they came and said, well, the space is not perfect, but man, there really is a need for the programming, then that opens the door for other partnerships. Mm -hmm. But if they say, um, there's not really a need, it would work here, but there's not really a need, then, I mean, we know anecdotally there's a need, but I don't know. If well, that's the part I also want prove proven. Right. Because it, it's kind of the go, no go. And I can tell you all the stories of the different restaurants that are telling me what their needs are. And even attending St. Pete College did a whole workforce um, input session down at the Seminole campus. And so, but I think we need to have data. So. Commissioner Peters. Oh, um, well, I was just, you, you included in this farm to table concept, right? I mean, did you include farm to table in your language? I thought I read that farm, farm to table. Yes. Yes. We're actually talking about trying to do a, with hopefully the botanical gardens, do a community garden that would be allowed to use in the program, so it would be a farm to table. So um, my thought on the, the farm to table, I think, is a good Mary, which I think is really great. Um, and not to compare the same, because that's free market and it's corporate, but uh, there's a place in Asheville, uh, Sierra Nevada, and it's a brewery, but they have the most amazing gardens, and it's every garden that's out there is what they use for their brewery and their restaurant. Um, and whenever I go there, which is whenever I can, um, I see more people touring and walking the gardens than they actually spend in the restaurant. And so I think there's something there. Mm -hmm. When you look at the entire park and the gardens, they're really, it might sound silly, but just watching what happens there is incredible. Um, and the fascination with the gardens, and I think it brings people back to, to, to what they can do back home. And so I, I think it's a good idea. I think you ought to do the feasibility study just to see. But and I do see a fit. So okay, thank you. Um, yes, Commissioner Gerard and then Eggers. Um, just, yeah, if we're going to do the study about that, though, I'd like to also look at like you said we already have a master plan for the gardens and i don't know about heritage village but we know they have some needs mm -hmm. can we look at how doing something like that would constrain their master plan mm -hmm. that's all sure well we can and how and whether farm to table is actually something they've ever wanted to do <laughs> which i haven't yeah heard. Now, i had actually talked with um, vernon about some of this and so i know he wasn't huh? happy. yeah i know okay <laughs> Mr. Eggers? Well, it seems to me like there's two different things here. One is taking a look at the entire facility that we have down there. And I think to your point about a, a better entrance way, sometimes it can be as simple as that. It really turns something around. I think about the, the History Museum in Dunedin where they had a side entrance for years and years and years and just had, it didn't get that much traffic. And they've moved it around to the front of the building. And the amount of traffic getting into the facility itself, and granted, it's smaller than this, but it really helped um, give identity to the to the museum and therefore more people coming into the museum. So I think that's a great thing. I think we need to have that kind of facility analysis and I think that's really an important component. This other thing, I totally agree with the idea. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out where it belongs, whether it belongs with us, because we have the same issue with manufacturing in the county and how do we develop the talent for the jobs that are out there and what role do we have? I mean, we have mm -hmm. AmSkills, we have P-Tech, we have all the, all the groups, every contractor's group has an association that provides uh, education opportunities and training and it's a real mishmash out there about what's going on and so kind of having a, a what is that overall picture? I think it's kind of similar to this as where does it belong? Does it belong in academia? Does it belong are we just looking for some space for them to, to take 
and if we do the other analysis that we don't have a need for it right now, then we do it for five years, and yeah, it could fit there and bring more traffic, fine. But again, I'm not sure where that belongs mm -hmm. and whether it's really up to us to be the ones that, that push that forward. Now, maybe a little funding like you're talking about to do the study would incorporate. I think it needs to incorporate both, though, not just one. I think we have to have both answers. So this is okay. just my thought. So. Well, how about if Barry and I work on this um, and bring you back um, again for later approval, but at least I will take it to the Tourist Development Council. They may tell me no, <laughs> so that might be the end of that, that they have no interest in this. Um, and I appreciate all of your comments. Um, I'm sorry that this came on so suddenly. Um, after our work session, Barry and I met and we started talking about this and he said, you know, if you're going to move forward, you probably need to give everybody the information, and so that's why I gave you as much as I did. And I'm sorry it was delayed, and um, I didn't, but I didn't want to bring it to the meeting under County Commission Miscellaneous and say, well, here you go. <laughs> and, can, I, yes. can I ask you a question? Because since Commissioner Welch brought it up, uh, it reminded <clears throat> me that I was in a conversation a couple days ago uh, with a gentleman who... Um, just had an extraordinary idea and without going too far down that road because we haven't had any discussion about new ideas but where are we with the um, <clears throat> white paper that Tim had done some time ago about the toy about town the area I would really like to know where that is and what we're doing and when we might potentially have that conversation because I know there's a lot of chit chat out and about in the community about great ideas, but we don't have a facility. So that was a we question. Had a feasibility, the, the study? feasibility study um, for the sports. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know you just looked I missed at me that blank. one <laughs> important piece where you said um, the Tourist Development Council has approved it. Um, the um, there was a RFP that was written by the Visit St. Pete Clearwater staff, but is now going through our staff to make sure it um, follows all the legal requirements and is um, fashioned correctly. And so. Um, we are moving forward with that. Will you keep us updated yes. on that? Because I have a great interest in it. Okay. And to um, oh, my Commissioner grand. Eggers' um, uh, comment about manufacturing, you know, that's something that we really ought to ask the Tampa Bay Innovation Center, since we are looking at building um, a state-of-the-art innovation center. We ought to ask them to take a look at talking with the manufacturers and seeing if they can address their concerns and needs, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. It seems like whenever you do that kind of mm -hmm. inventory of, of, of skill sets or organizations that are out there to develop those services, you find a, a lot of folks involved and very, very little connectivity. Sometimes there is good connectivity, but I think sometimes it's good to kind of get that overall sense of where we are, mm -hmm. where we're falling short, what we're doing well, and um, they might be a good focal point. You're right. Okay, I'll take that. I'll send something to them in that regard. Commissioner Seal, if you're going to do that, can you also um, make an inquiry of Mike Mydell? I guess he isn't here anymore, but there's a group in, Pine in Pinellas, I, it might be Tampa Bay wide, but I know it's here in Pinellas called BAMA, and it's yeah. the Bay Area Manufacturing Association because right. they might want to weigh in on that as well. I'm sure, you know, Bama's not as active as they used to be. They still exist, but um, I know I've talked to Mike Mydell before about Bama and um, the manufacturing. But we will, I think, moving this to the Tampa Bay Innovation Center would be a perfect place to have it go. So thank you all very much for your um, thoughtful comments and for um, all of the information. I'm moving on to County Commission miscellaneous, but what I want to, I'm going to start out because it, it kind of um, dovetails on something that Kathleen Peters um, commented. So Jake and I, when we were out at the um, park, um, Sand Key Park, and we were talking about the um, different things we started talking about gardening and he has a garden and I have a garden of sorts in my house 
And so we start talking about community gardens and the fact that some of the cities use some of their property and literally lease it out to citizens to do their community gardens, um, their own garden within. And we have quite a bit of space at the um, Eagle Lake Park. We have quite a bit of space at some of our other parks. So I have tentatively gotten leases from the city of St. Pete and from Safety Harbor where I know they both have, and I think Dunedin has maybe some community gardens. And it's just early, early, early on. I have a lot more fact data to collect, but it was something I just thought was timely since you mentioned it, um, Commissioner Peters, that um, I'm working on that. So it'll come back later. Um, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Real quickly, um, the Florida Local Government Investment Trust met on the 24th. Uh, Claritha is on our advisory board. And um, I've also been joined by former FAC and NACO President Brian De Deloach oh. uh, as a trustee board member and also Doug Martin. So there are two presidents and a former vice president. Um, I wanted to uh, thank our chair, Paula O'Neill. I don't know if it's with our clerk folks retiring. But she's the Pasco County Clerk, and she's been our chair. Uh, she is leaving office in June and retiring. And so I just wanted to thank uh, Paula for her leadership. Um, FL Git, what do we call it? Fligit? Yes. Fligit manages funds for counties and cities throughout the state of Florida. <clears throat> uh, and at the last update, there are about $881 million in a short term fund, about $848 million in the day to day. And I just wanted to thank uh, Claritha and her advisory board for all their hard work. Um, that wasn't your last meeting, was it? Mm. <laughs> There's another one in I, June. That would not be my last okay. meeting. <laughs> um, but uh, they do a tremendous amount of work, very good investment uh, vehicle for counties and cities and special districts around the state. And Madam Chair, um, I. I also want to thank uh, Commissioner Justice. That was a great pure Pinellas today. I had no mm -hmm. idea uh, Jordan would be here. He's a great sax player. I've known him for a while. So uh, well done, sir. Thank you. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Okay. Commissioner Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I'm still doing all my tours. I'm enjoying it. Went to the health clinic the other day. Uh, small, and it's amazing how productive they are with what they do with that clinic. Um, uh, I also uh, attended the Early Learning Coalition. Now, they were at real risk for the legislature to redo the formulation on how they get their funding for early learning. Um, and, and if uh, Representative Grawl gets her way, Pinellas County could lose a significant amount of money for our early learning between BPK and so forth. So it wasn't successful this year. Um, uh, lots of people made phone calls to really stop that change um, but it's something that we'll have to be watching in the future because I do believe it'll come up again next year and Pinellas County would stand to lose significant funding so um, that's about it and uh, and I'm just looking forward to working on more mental health and addiction stuff with y'all okay thank you because Commissioner Welch you thank had you. something Commissioner uh, Peters reminded me I had one other question you know a lot in the news about hepatitis A yeah and mm -hmm. it's like every day there's a story can we get an update from Dr. Cho, maybe five, ten minutes, just to come here and speak on that issue. Sure. There's a lot of concern, and I don't. Okay. He's here have, Thursday, isn't he? He's here Thursday. He's here this Thursday. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That would be great to get. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Here. Great, Commissioner Justice. Will he be bringing hypodermics? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Did you say that? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, wanted to thank everyone. Uh, we had several commissioners attend the uh, Area Agency on Aging annual luncheon at the Largo Cultural Center uh, a couple weeks ago. Secretary of Elder Affairs uh, gave a great presentation, a lot of good information. Uh, we forwarded out his presentation to everybody. Uh, really, a lot of good information and had a chance to talk with them beforehand. And um, he's worked his way up through the process, so he really understands the delivery of the services throughout the state. So it was all, all good stuff. A uh, reminder that the Stormwater Wastewater Task Force will be May 23rd at uh, Seminole Campus of St. Petersburg College. What time, Charlie? What time? 9 a.m. Uh, Gulf Consortium next meeting is in June in Orange County. Um, and then uh, just a few of the other meetings that have come up. Uh, uh, or, give me a while. Commissioner Peters and I 
uh, represented at the Knights of Columbus uh, First Responder Awards Dinner. Uh, great event. Uh, George Mercado and his team did a really nice job. Um, last week we had uh, kind of divided and conquered. I know that some of us went to the Vincent House, mm -hmm. some went to the Palms of Pinellas. Uh, I was at the oh, Superintendent's cool. Roundtable Luncheon. Uh, a lot of good information from uh, Superintendent Grego and the school uh, system and really some of the awards that they've won this year. Uh, a lot of good things happening there. Um, met with uh, uh, the AmSkills folks uh, at uh, the exchange as we're talking about space and manufacturing and uh, they're very excited about $250,000 grant that they got for training so that's uh, hopefully good things to come for Lelman specifically and a uh, reminder that Wednesday May 15th at 3 p.m. Uh, is a dedication at USF St. Pete of William Hall Heller Hall uh, if you can join us that would be wonderful and then um, the only question I had is the timetable for uh, when our um, space use study will be complete and when we'll be having a presentation on it I think it's due here in May. May? Okay. May. Correct. Okay. And then. <laughs> sure. <coughs> That's when we're supposed to get the draft. Wow. Well, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I wanted to comment on the Erie Agency on Aging Lunch, too. It was really refreshing to see a state department head that actually had lots of experience and education about that particular topic in this day and age we don't always have that um, and he's fairly new newly appointed um, we had a career source board meeting where we accepted the city of st. Petersburg letter of intent to um, purchase the Science Center we had a, a public safety coordinating council yesterday where we had a presentation on the empowerment team very interesting um, and there is a report, there's a first year report that we could distribute if AZ will get it to us. That would be great. Um, as well as a, a mobile, health, mobile mental health response uh, unit for youth. That was interesting as well. That's brand new though. <coughs> um, I think that might be all. Oh been to a couple of uh, habitat dedications. Some of us went to both the Palms of Pinellas and the Vincent House thing, which was <laughs> <laughs> racing from one place to another. Um, and I attended the uh, uh, Regional Planning Council Future, the Region Awards, where we got a couple of awards that I can't remember what they are right now, but from Raheem's department. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Yes, uh, Forward Pinellas, uh, we're meeting tomorrow. So just as a tickler for those who may want to know what's going on, we're going to talk a little bit about the Advantage Pinellas plan, transportation alternatives. We're going to take another shot at uh, some creative ideas about Belcher and Gulf to Bay intersection. Uh, we've had a list of those over the years, but uh, this is kind of a new and different kind of look at it. We're going to get an update on Tampa Bay next and talk about Bike Walk Tampa Bay, which is all about pads and bikes and safety and all of that, which we can't talk about enough uh, because of the issues that we have. Uh, Janet, you're going to talk about PSTA, right? Yes, I will. Okay. Um, and then uh, just uh, under my VA community, just wanted to remind everybody, Memorial Day is just around the corner. I know Oldsmar's having one at uh, a ceremony at 11, uh, Curlew Hills at 10, the VA has one, I think, at 10, and the city of Clearwater has one. So there's plenty of opportunities to, to... Yeah, I'm sure Largo. Evening. Yeah, these should do Monday evening, don't they? Usually yeah. So there's plenty of opportunities to get to, um, to a, a ceremony and bring some family, bring some kids so that they understand that, uh, the meaning of that day. Um, Tampa Bay Water, we have an executive meeting in a week um, or two. Two. Uh, there seems to be other things developing there, which... Um, just just cause a lot of uh, head shaking. So um, trying to sort out uh, hearsay from facts, uh, we're still doing some investigating, but um, I'm still concerned about some of the independent activity of the of, of city of Tampa and maybe growingly the Hillsborough County. So uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep a real good uh, eye on that. Uh, we'll have some more discussion. I'm sure some of those kind of things will be flushed out at our meeting in two weeks. And uh, we'll keep, obviously, this board apprised of any decisions that 
may end up coming back to the board as, as, as a member of Tampa Bay Water uh, versus the decisions that are being made at, by Tampa Bay, the board itself. So we'll keep you apprised of that. Uh, TMA, the next meeting is June 7th, and we'll continue to talk about the status of that 41-mile project. Um, June 5th for the Pinellas County Collaborative. And um, there's an article which I'll send to everybody um, that just came out. Um, uh, I think it's in uh, Florida Trend. On Florida Healthy Kids Corporation receives funding to make full pay plan more affordable. Uh, basically allowing many, many kids that are uninsured right now to, to get insured. And so um, I just saw this yesterday, and so it's really it's a really good uh, really good article. So I'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of that. But uh, they're doing some good work up there, and hopefully getting more kids um, insured, uh, which is really an important, um, I guess, mission. The only mission that they have. So stay tuned on that. Some just some other things that are happening. Um, the PC, uh, Pinellas County Law Enforcement Memorial is tomorrow at uh, I think it's at ten o'clock. Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock at the sheriff's campus um, usually lasts about a half hour 45 minutes uh, giving uh, acknowledgement to our to our law enforcement that lost their lives in the last year and those uh, pr prior to that um, there's a curlew creek smith bayou um, uh, b branch public meeting tomorrow night at five o'clock so there's a lot of issues relating to our creek management of uh, smith bayou area uh, a lot of residents call our office to get a clear understanding about what their responsibilities are and what our responsibilities are. So among many things that might be talked about, uh, you might be able to get some of your questions answered at that meeting. Um, and then last two things, um, there is a Veterans Counseling Veterans uh, Suicide Forum at the Epicenter on the 18th at 9 a.m. Um, so I think it's another good opportunity for people to come together to talk about one of the really sad stories in our country that's ongoing. Um, at the same time, um, Pinellas County Behavioral Group is going to unveil their suicide study results of the, I, it's not their study, but um, Baycare and uh, USF put a study together and that those will be unveiled, I guess, at that meeting. So. There's a lot of interest and effort and energy going into trying to pinpoint that, um, I guess, what the trigger points and everything else that go into a veteran uh, taking that awful last step. Um, so uh, stay tuned on that. Again, kudos to our group for uh, putting together that uh, Veterans Coalition meeting. Uh, Lord, I really appreciate that. Um, a lot of energy there, and I continue to reach out to our veterans groups to make sure that they're aware and of pre and I know that some of them were present too, but uh, just to, to continue to get that information out. Um, and then the last thing, I just, I, I'm not quite sure where to go with this one, Barry, but um, the FAA had a workshop um, last week on the airport um, and some things that might be happening from a flight uh, direction standpoint in the next five to eight years, but they're just out gathering information now and getting feedback from communities. Uh, and our airport folks were there, but there were a lot of people from Pinellas County that showed up to just find out what's going on. And, you know, it might be a good thing at some one of our workshops just to kind of say, hey, here's what's, here's what's happening and here's what's going on for interaction from the Pi Airport and from the Tampa Airport as it relates to flight patterns over Pinellas County. And some, the Dill. Yeah, well, that too. Some that may have um, some relevance to us, and this is the time to give input, uh, and some that may not have as much relevance because the height at which they cross Pinellas County may be too high for noise, but I think it might be a good idea for us to get a real, it was a really good meeting. Uh, it was just kind of an interactive meeting with stations, but I think it might be good for us to get a handle on what they're talking about at this very, very early stage. Um, so I hadn't get it, hadn't had a chance to talk to Tom yet, but maybe we should look into that. Yeah. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm not so sure it's early stages, Commissioner Eggers, because I can tell you that the flight patterns have changed dramatically that go over where I live. 
And let me tell you something, those jets are coming in really, really low. So I think about where I am versus where the nearest airport is, and it's significant. So I'm just letting everybody know. It's probably Tampa International flights. Yeah. That's, well, I don't know. I've, but, looked at, I mean, I've looked at all the flight patterns in years past, and you wouldn't believe how many come down um, the Gulf, and then they cut over. Yeah. yeah right. Especially during the winter season when you have the northerly wind right. flows, so they have to come around and, and land into the wind. So now in the summertime, they change, the, the winds come from the south, so they'll come flying in a little bit differently. But you're right. There is a lot going over the county yeah. right now. I don't okay. think that has to My do with FD. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, so you won't be surprised that uh, some of my report today, or a lot of it, has to do with transportation and transportation funding. And of particular interest, I'm sure it will be to Bill, uh, you know this is great news, the legislature appropriated $2.5 million for T. Barta. And um, our, our ask was $1.5. And the reason that that number is larger is because the chair, Chair Hudson from Jacksonville, Senator Hudson, wants all of the transportation initiatives from Tampa Bay to flow through T. Barna, which is not such a bad thing because it gives us a real opportunity to have relevance in, for, the, for the agency. Um, that said, one of the things that we w did not understand until very recently, thank you Debbie Leos for making us aware, the Florida Department of Transportation in that 41 mile feasibility study that I've been talking about for a while um, requires a 20% match from our local government contribution. So I believe, Barry, you should have gotten a letter by now from David Green advising you of our new commitment for T. Barda, our new contribution number. And with that said, um, I think that between Barry and the county attorney, it would really be good if all of us, before we have that funding meeting, whenever that's going to be, to talk about the solutions, that it's important to have on the table the fact that the county, our county, does contribute to T. Barta for the regional transportation, whatever that turns out to be. We don't contribute to PSTA. And to me, that's, um, Commissioner Gerard brought it up at some point. I don't remember if it was a PSTA or here. But other counties do contribute from their county budgets to their transit system. And so I think, you know, if we all care about it, we all know that we have issues in our county with public transportation options. And as the options grow, seems to me that we have more of a responsibility to do our part. And I'm pretty sure it's not going to be a great big surprise to hear that the city of St. Petersburg will be coming here shortly to talk about the new plans for the uh, ferry that goes back and forth from Pinellas to Hillsborough. So it's just a, another um, wake up call that, you know, there's a lot of options on the table. Part of that extra million dollars for T. Bartit is to study the new technologies like Hyperloop like the cable system that Daryl LeClaire has talked to so many of us about and all of the new autonomous vehicle opportunities. So we're going to be having a lot of conversation about these things going forward. And um, so stay tuned on all of that. But that, whatever we're calling it, workshop meeting or whatever, really needs to entail all the partners there and not just us and or the TDC, but there's a lot of players that have an involvement in how we move forward. That said, T. Barta also made the recommendation for the award to our federal advocacy firm, and it is going to be Van Skoyak, which made me very happy. Um, and then we did um, approve the award for the PD&E 
um, in an amount not to exceed five million dollars and that's the piece that the state of Florida is going to want us to have a contribution in. Um, that project is going to be funded by state grants, federal grants, and local government partners. Um, okay, that completes my report, I think, on TBART. If I forgot anything, Commissioner Seal, I know you'll fill in the blanks. Uh, yesterday at um, PSTA, we had an executive committee meeting that got a little bit off the rails because we started the conversation about um, the seven areas within our county that do not participate in PSTA, and yet our system goes through those areas. So clearly, you know, it's very unfair, and for some of the members of the board, it's a real rub to them. And I hope when we have the conversation, you'll keep that in mind. So a lot of our conversation yesterday revolved around funding and the issues and um, a month ago, almost a month ago, we had a very contentious meeting on St. Pete Beach about the line that goes from downtown St. Pete out to the beaches. We we are have been working really hard with the new city manager out there as well as their city council to be amenable to, you know, meet all of their requirements that they want us to try and meet and to be better partners with them. And we are scheduled to go back down there on May 14th to share the results of all the work we've been doing over the last month. So I do believe we worked out a very nice compromise. And with all of that said, the now South Pasadena is raising concerns that they have and legitimately, I want to share with you that their concerns are not real. They're, they're picking up on a very well-organized group. A lot of the folks that are part of that group were part of the No Tracks for Tracks, who are just the best, the best at twisting a message with information that's not factual. So we have worked hard to provide the folks that have been writing to me, at least, I don't know if they're writing to all of you, um, with a response that clearly speaks to every one of their concerns. And if Doyle hasn't shared that with you, um, Doyle, please share it with all of my colleagues here. Um, okay, so I think that completes my, Commissioner Gerard, did I leave out anything from yesterday? I think we. I don't think so. Oh, one last thing is that results to PSTA. We had a promotional service in partnership with the city of Clearwater for the entire month of April, and it was a big, big success. I'm telling you, especially because this year for the first time, the Sugar Sand Festival ran for three weeks and not two. But we gave, we had 32,000 riders that took the PSTA uh, bus or trolley over the bridge out to the beach and uh, just loved it. So I think that's a great little success story. We can, all can use a lot of those. That promotion ended on April 30th. And if you, you didn't get out to the Sugar Sand Festival, I encourage you to do so. It is an extraordinary, extraordinary event. And there's nothing that will touch your heart like the sunsets on Clearwater Beach. I'm sorry, they are just to die for. Okay. Um, I do want to share, and I think I did touch on it, but I just want to make sure you all remember that I did, that when I was out at Vincent House, Bob Dillinger and I got into a very in-depth discussion about a central receiving facility. I think Commissioner... Peters has that high on her list as well. And we are scheduled to have a meeting with the new CEO of Largo Med to see if we can, or if HCA, because they have so many facilities in Pinellas, can offer some assistance in that regard at some of their facilities. And we'll see where that conversation goes. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? 
and I don't know if you've been paying attention to some of the um, to some of the issues that have been surfacing in the in the press about Bayfront, Commissioner Welch. I don't. I hope you're on top of all of that. Absolutely. It doesn't sound good. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, A really interesting, interesting summit was held this last week with folks from the Harvard Business School. And the title of their focus for being here was an introduction to climate adaptation finance and valuation summit recap. Some of you may have read the article that uh, Graham Brink is it Brink or Brinkman, the reporter that in the business section of the press? You know who I'm talking about? Or Brink? Yeah. Um, wrote a great article about that summit and about some of the things that were brought to people's consciousness. But, I mean, if you didn't get a chance to read the article that's on the front page today about the state of our nature and environment and how at risk it is, it is really not, we've got to get our heads out of the sand and really pay attention to that. It's frightening, really, especially if you have little itty-bitty grandchildren, Commissioner Seal. I mean, it's, you really worry about what good grief, what's it going to look like when they get to be big. Um, also, this is the last thing. Uh, I think it was a week ago. It might have been a little more. I forgot the exact date. Commissioner Welch and myself, Commissioner Justice was under the weather that day. We had a Earth Day press conference over in the little Leelman Park over there. And it was very, very well attended and just the most magnificent Chamber of Commerce day. Not a cloud in the sky. It was gorgeous. What? Working. It was Bartlett Park, not Lelman. Yeah. I know when you mention justice, it goes to Lelman, but it does. I'm Bartlett sorry. Park. I okay. Well, <laughs> it's kind of, sort of in the same area. A <clears throat> little bit, a little bit, maybe. <laughs> not. No, <laughs> get down there more often. <laughs> okay. That's the end of my report. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. okay. Um, never mind. <laughs> because time is kind of of the essence. I just wanted to ask you all, have you all each um, visited the Florida Holocaust Museum recently? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Is everyone? Yeah. If you haven't, then the names, the other you know, they'll be in you. touch with your office, but they have some security concerns mm -hmm. um, that um, I have talked a little bit about with Barry, but I, um, talking about the tourist development fund, it might be um, a, a place to ask for this budget request that they've asked for. Um, it seems logical under emergency. I mean, I need to figure it out, but, you know, to me, when there's a safety concern at one of our major um, tourist facilities, this might need to be considered separately in an emergency fashion. Well, and especially as many children as they have going in and out right. there. I mean, well, I physically kids. went and saw it, and I am very concerned about it. Commissioner I, I agree. I submitted a decision package as well on that issue. But it might be logical. This is the capital. Either way, yeah. I think the state judge did come forward they did. with some money. State, at least like it's in the it. budget. It looked like in the so paper far. today that they were, well, well assuming it doesn't get budget, vetoed. But that, the request that they're making counts that in already, it, yeah. that they would be receiving the yeah, state. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. Yes. Is there a way that we could see everyone's decision packet? Because I'm hearing, oh, I got the decision packet. Right now. And the decision packet is that. You will, you will get them all. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. We get to talk about them quite in depth, actually. So right. again, just so you're not surprised, since I'm going to that May 15th budget meeting, I should have given this to you in writing, but I had everything kind of piled up. But um, at least I'm going to talk about it with them. So the Tourist Development Council. Okay. Again, thank you, Charlie. I think that was the best pure Pinellas ever. That's what you said last time. I said that last time, but that <laughs> keeps getting better every time. No pressure now. Um, and also, I meant to say congratulations to Sally Parks. Um, I understand she received the Area Agency great. Aging yeah. Award. And so our former colleague, um, well-deserved. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.